When hiding hurts more than it helps, if you've experienced church hurt, religious trauma, spiritual abuse, or anything like that, you may have asked the question, should I tell someone or should I not? Should I stay quiet to protect people and ministries and the peace, or should I tell someone else to protect people? We're going to talk about that question and more on today's episode of the podcast, and we are so glad that you're here. Like always, we want to remind you these conversations are real, they are authentic, and some of the topics we talk about, the stories we tell, may be triggering to some of the more sensitive members of our audience. So if that's you, if you feel triggered at any time, feel free to leave the podcast and to come back later. Always protect you first. But hey, we're pumped about this conversation, so why don't you join me for episode three of the Church Disrupted Podcast. All right, guys, welcome back to Church Disrupted with your host, Jeff Cochran. Today, I'm here with Sarai Miller and Vicki May, and we have a hot podcast coming for you. Uh, the topic today, we're talking about when hiding hurts, because often we think if we tell the truth about abuses that we've seen in the church, or if we even tell our own story of church hurt, maybe your story is not of spiritual abuse, it's just of deep church hurt. The fear is, if we tell our stories that... We're going to make people look bad. We're going to make God look bad. We're going to make the church look bad. We're going to destroy families and ministries and all these things. And that's a heavy, heavy weight, right? So we don't say anything. The problem is a lot of times when we hide and we don't say anything, we're not actually protecting the people and ministries we think we're protecting. We're actually causing more harm um, and we're even causing more harm to ourselves. So that's what we're talking about today. When hiding hurts, you don't want to miss any of this podcast. But hey, before we jump back in, I just want to give a shout out to everybody who's been supporting us so far. We're so grateful for you. Um, this is not easy. Okay, this is not easy. This is not inexpensive. Um, if you think it's inexpensive, you should ask my wife. She is quite upset about the money that I have spent on this podcast. But we're so grateful that you support it because this wouldn't happen without you. It's not easy. It's not inexpensive. And every time you support us in any way, you make sure that more people get to hear this podcast. And as we grow, you're making sure by supporting us that more people get to tell their stories. That's the thing I'm most excited about about our community and this podcast is the opportunity for people to tell their stories in a safe way. But hey, I want to give a shout out specifically to everybody who's been sharing on social media, who's liked, subscribed on YouTube, who's sharing the short clips. We're so grateful for you. I want to give a special shout out to everybody in the Church Disrupted community, all of our disruptors, our catalysts, our table flippers. Uh, you guys are growing like never before, and I'm so, so grateful for you. If you're interested in joining the Church Disrupted community, just go to disrupted.church, and you can find out uh, the different community levels, which one's right for you. Um, but again, no matter how you're supporting us, even if you're just telling somebody else about the podcast or leaving a review, we are grateful and it means an absolute ton. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But let's go ahead. Let's jump in. Cause there's some, there's some spice to this one. I say that like there hasn't been spice to the other ones. <laughs> well, yeah. Don't discredit the others. Cause it, this is just its special own kind of spice. This yeah. one was hot sauce. This yeah. one's more like seasoning. Ghost pepper. Yeah. I, I, go. Ghost pepper hot. I don't think there's been a non-spicy <laughs> episode yet. Um, and some people are going to be asking, Jeff, why are the episodes explicit? Why are they tagged explicit on, on Spotify? And I feel like this is important to say, the episodes are explicit because we talk about real things, and we're not going to have an episode where we don't say the word spiritual abuse or where we're not talking about some things that, even though they're not bad, they're going to be triggering for some people. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, hey, I want you to know if you're watching, you may be watching this and supporting this because you believe in what we're doing, but you've been through some deep trauma, some deep church hurt. You've been through spiritual abuse. And uh, there may be some episodes where you just, you literally need to tune out mm -hmm. because it's triggering you. And I want you to know that's okay. We always want to help you. We always want to help you heal. We love you. We never want to trigger you. Um, the other reason we put it on explicit every single time is because regardless of whether there's explicit language, I think we cussed a few times. I don't think it's explicit, but this podcast is not for people under the age of 17 is really not. So by putting that explicit tag on there, we make sure that, you know, um, 
kids or middle schoolers specifically aren't um, connecting this podcast on a regular basis where they may not have a parent to walk through this with them because we don't want to make uh, a middle school or young high school kid hate the church because they don't have context on this, right? So um, anyway, some of y'all have been asking. Um, they're always spicy, but they're listed as extra explicit spicy um, <laughs> just to uh, to protect people, right? Um, but when hiding hurts, when hiding hurts, Leading up to starting this podcast, we've already had a lot of laughs, but also had a lot of like deep breath moments. Like, mm. hey, remember to breathe. Yes. Right. Because even with us who have all shared things before, right, we're on this podcast, we're going to be on this podcast. It is still hard to hit record and turn on this mic. No matter how many episodes we do, it is still hard to hit record, turn on the mic and start telling our stories because there's this fear there's this thought, there's this anxiety, like someone is going to come after me for mm -hmm. this. And even though sometimes it's illogical, sometimes it's more logical than we want to admit, which is sad. Right. Sometimes it's, it's even illogical, but that doesn't go away. And we actually talked about that's one of the reasons why we don't share and why we hide so much because that anxiety is heightened, right? Like I, I know I have less of that anxiety than ever now because I've went public with a lot of things. I do this podcast. I've written an open letter, right? I, I've done all of those things. Um, you guys have had conversations about this stuff. Why is it that you think it's still so scary, even after all that, for us to share our story or talk about um, these dark things that have happened and bringing them into the light? Um, personally, it's, I mean, I'm sure the community aspect of leaving, you know, a certain type of control group and um, understanding that your previous community, and this is if you've already gotten out and created your own community. Um, which some people haven't. Right, which you have, which is, is terrifying. I mean, it, it, it is it is terrifying because you expect your community to be like, oh my God, they're, they're watching. Yeah, the they're fear gonna, that I may lose my community they're gonna hate me. overnight. Or, or worse, they're going to talk about me and then they're going to, they're going to tell everybody that I'm a liar and I'm a fraud and that nothing I say is true. It, it's, it has so much because they're so insular. Have you ever had a best friend that no matter how bad of a person you are, they will always cover for you? That's how I feel like I'm the outsider and there are best friends that no matter what I say, regardless of the truth, I mean, the truth should not have an explanation. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a fact. Well, it reminds me of the meme that's going around on social media. You know, hey, I'm an every season kind of friend. You know, I'm a I'm a go to the movies kind of friend. I'm a eat chicken wings kind of friend. I'm a bury the body in the backyard kind of friend. And that's funny on a meme, mm -hmm. but it's often true in the church world right. that people are willing to bury bodies for other people almost figuratively. Um, these are traumatized people, traumatized souls, and we're willing to bury it to protect what's comfortable for us. And no matter how much on the inside you are, if you ever step and say something on the outside, you are immediately in a different place and you're untrusted. Right. And you could even be, you hopefully ostracized or, you know, pushed aside, pushed out. Um, I think it's scary. It's scary. It's a scary place to be because you, it, once you speak out, then you're carrying the weight of what you had to say, mm -hmm. the knowledge that you know, and that's mm -hmm. scary enough as it is, but it's not good to carry it within all the time. Like you said, you need to talk to people. You have to get it out because that, is where her keeps hurting and it's really only hurting you and it's not helping your church at all by hiding it. And it's not helping anybody else that, you know, in your group of friends or your circle, your small group, whomever, because the truth is the truth. Yeah. Don't diminish your trauma. No, don't diminish your trauma. I agree. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to, to go out there because most of the time, well, in like in my life, they're like, you're, you don't have enough faith. You're, being dramatic, that's a good one. I, I like that one a lot. Well, being, being dramatic, dramatic. That, mm. that goes to the episode we did on gaslighting. Right. Right? Being like, dramatic, you just need to pray about it and move on. And and, and, and that's, that's part of the conditioning of why you stay quiet. Because honestly, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, am I being dramatic? Am I, am I really just stumbling others? And, and this, is the, this is coming from a person that doesn't go to church anymore. I'm done. I am 
I am, I am done. And I am done because I never want to put myself, I'm a, I'm a never again kind of person. I never want to put myself in a position where someone can control how I think, what I can wear, how I raise my children, what I can say to my children, how my husband is allowed to treat me, hmm. how I'm allowed to take that treatment. None of that is your business as, a, as another human being. Mm-hmm. And so with all that conditioning that comes with that, unfortunately, in the back of your mind, you're saying, well, I might be lacking of faith. I might. And then and you kind of wire yourself to say, okay, fine, I have no faith. Mm-hmm. Because that's the only way you can wire yourself into thinking, well, I don't, I don't care about this community anymore. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't want it. So I would say if I could, and if I could just lean into that as a friend, you know, so I, I think that that's the greater damage mm-hmm. for you, right? Mm-hmm. And when you hear things like you don't have enough faith or you're just being dramatic, mm-hmm. that, those are heavy gaslighting phrases that are designed to make you think you're crazy, right? And you said it. You start thinking, well, maybe I don't have enough faith. Yeah, maybe good. I am being just dramatic. So your answer, though, was you had finally been hurt enough that your answer was, well, fine. If I am being dramatic and if I don't have faith, then I'll go live without faith and that's dramatic. That's what I'm going to do. Right? Yeah, that's, mm. that's the... Well, then that which might be beyond the mental capacity of that, which is heavy enough, but it definitely hurt you spiritually. It has oh, hurt you spiritually. I, I don't even have that. Um, no. And then, you know. Well, no, no. I, all right. I'm going to challenge you on that. You have a spirit. Mm. You may not be a practicing faith, practicing spiritual person right now because you have been hurt so badly, but the wounds in our spirit, doctors don't know how to heal, right? The wounds in our spirit can only be healed through you know, therapy and community and oftentimes community with faith. So we will run away from it um, because of that pain, because we can't take any more wounding and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Right. But I think it's, a, it, it's dangerous. I think it's it, not, even, not only dangerous. I think it's unfair for you to say like, I'm not a spiritual person. You may never do another faith thing again. You may never go to a church again. Right. But you are a spiritual person who has a beautiful spirit mm-hmm. and it has been hurt and you have been spiritually abused because the inner parts of you is what's been abused. These these aren't bruises that could heal, right? And I mean, continuing with the with the hiding part, um, I have been to therapy. I have. Good. I'm proud of you. That's awesome. You but wait. Everybody, <laughs> oh everybody well, should. Where was it? Yeah. At? Was oh, wait. Okay. So picture? so here's the thing. Therapy doesn't work if you're not honest. Oh, 100%. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So yeah. here we go. When I, when I went to therapy the you first time. You can hide in therapy. You can. Oh, you can. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say this because I think this needs to be said. Like I tell y'all you need to go to therapy all the time and pastors, every pastor needs to be in therapy. Every person needs to be in therapy. The first time I went to therapy, I was basically crying in the corner like a seven-year-old boy because I was committed to being honest. And guys, it hurt. Yeah. It hurt. Mm-hmm. But if I wasn't honest, I would have never been able to walk out of the PTSD triggers yes. that I've been living with. I, I had lived in a war zone growing up, had no idea how much it had affected me. But I will never forget being in that office crying like an absolute baby uncontrollably. And people who know me, I don't cry a lot, especially before I went to therapy. I didn't cry ever. Mm-hmm. And the fear was at one point, I literally wondered, am I going to die here crying? Because I don't think he turned it on. I don't think I'll ever be able to turn it off. I'm going to die of dehydration crying here. So That's when I, funny. Not, not that you cried. It was the way you said they turned it on. I have a it, story for Oh, that. gosh. It's so real. But, but I think we need to be honest here. When I'm telling you you need to go to therapy, I'm telling you it is worth it. But I'm also telling you the same thing that this I said. If you're not honest, it doesn't work. And if you are honest, it's going to hurt. But here's the thing. Every bit of that hurt that you don't want to come out, you're already living with it every day. That's why life is so painful, right? We got to get that hurt out of our spirit. I'm still working on that. So when I was a little girl, um, because of what happened to me, that was one of the things my mother had decided, well, okay, I can't go to the police. <laughs> so I'm And for the her. listeners that don't know, you were sexually abused I in was a at church eight, setting. eight years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it was an elder. Um, so it's, it's hard to accuse someone that high up. Um, but don't get me wrong. I did. <laughs> I did. I, I said something. It's just, you know, the, the rules did not, 
You know, it was a he said, she said at eight years old. And who are they going to believe, the eight-year-old girl or the elder, when women had less meaning, less value, less authority in that tradition than anybody else? And as a small child, you don't know how to deal with that. So all I did was cry. I mean, you, I went to Disney World, and mm. I was in tears. So my mother decided, sorry, my mother decided that uh, it was time for therapy. But, but there's only certain things you can't say in therapy. <laughs> Anything that makes the church look bad is one right. of those. You so cannot the make that you needed to talk about. You couldn't say right. in this particular kind of therapy. Right. So well, instead, then, then that's not therapy. right. So instead, <laughs> I went to a psychiatrist, and it, basically the the request was she needs to stop crying. That's the only reason they're taking you is her eyes are leaking she, and it's bothering us. She's, she is a mess, and you need to fix it. Um, so the doctor quite literally said. Well, this little pill is going to turn those water faucets off. And as yours were turned on, mine were turned off. Mm. And to this oh day, gosh. you will never see me. Like, when you see me tear up, I am a master at putting those back. Because crying was a weakness that was not allowed. Mm. That is so sad, though. Like, because I grew up not crying. Because it was a weakness, it's right? Weakness. And now, now I cry way too easily. Like I'm watching a movie, and it's a little bit, you know, sad at the end. Like I watched the uh, my son was watching earlier today because you know he's he's home for the summer, and um, he was watching Big Bang Theory and was watching oh the, God, the the ending? final episode. And I'm over there, just, I'm a mess in the kitchen, right? Because because I cry easily now. Mm-hmm. Right. But I didn't before, because but I'm, I'm married to a therapist, right? Y'all know I'm married to a therapist. And, and here's what she told me. I didn't realize for a long time, your emotions are not bad. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're always valid. Your emotions are always valid. They may not be realistic. They may not, you, what you may be feeling may not be true. It doesn't mean it's invalid. Your emotions are telling you something. Mm -hmm. They're an alarm signal. They're, 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 something is warning you about something that's going on. So when you're crying, that's letting you know that something is going on, both good or bad. When we hold that in, we actually turn off the alarm signal and the alarm situation that we were given at birth, right? And we end up just hurting ourselves worse. It's okay to feel those emotions. The next thing you need to ask though is, Hey, what, why am I feeling these emotions? What are my emotions trying to tell me right now? Yeah, and that's what I was going to add was that's it's sad that that was turned off because that's a natural emotion that we all were given. We were all given these emotions for a reason. Hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, from, in my opinion, given to, to us by our creator. And um, he wouldn't give them to us if we weren't supposed to use them in some form or fashion. I mean, he got angry. Jesus got angry mm -hmm. when he flipped the table. He did. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and again, in, in showing showing his frustration, but also making sure that he processed the, the, the emotions correctly yeah. in that moment for the benefit of everyone, not just to be angry, right? right? And a lot of people would say that Jesus didn't handle his emotions correctly. If you change the names in the situation and told that story and people didn't realize it was Bible, they'd go, Oh, that dude flew off the handle. He didn't, he didn't handle his emotions well at all. Right. What was his reasoning behind it though? But mm. the truth is he did. Mm. He handled his emotions because it was the poorest and most marginalized of people who were being affected by what the money changers were doing, which is why we're doing this. Absolutely. There are people who would say, Jeff, Vicky, Sarai, you're not handling your emotions correctly. You guys are taking your hurt. Now you're putting it out on other people. You're, you're causing hurt. Not, you're just trying to talk bad about people. And and causing whatever, division, and whatever. You know, tearing well, down not, the body of Christ. total opposite thing and that we're trying to that do that is here. why our anxiety spikes. Because yeah. you're saying, because good people, and I'm, I'm not saying a good, I'm a good person, but normally good people. You're a good person. Feel um, a certain um, accountability for what they do. Mm, sure. There's, absolutely. And when you tell us that we need to be accountable for something that we have done that in others' opinion is wrong, we take that into consideration. Mm. And there that nagging at the back of your head is I've I'm messing up right now. And, yeah. and you have to push through that because you know you have to know what's right and you have to fight for what's right. Yeah. And that's why we're here because there are people who are not listening to that accountability yeah. filter. Right. <laughs> and one of the things that makes it even tougher. I would posit this. It is even tougher 
to hold people accountable when you care about the people who need to be held accountable. Absolutely. Like you and Vicky, you and I, we, we talked about this a bunch, right? Um, we care deeply about the people who hurt us most. It is really hard for me to push on the people. It was really hard for me to push on the person who hurt me most because it's one of the people that I love most on this planet. I can hold both of those things at the same time, Mm -hmm. right? And I still remember talking to a group of elders around this table about the situation, and they literally pulled up a book that I wrote because I've written a lot of different books. Most of them are on leadership. Next book that's going to be coming out is going to be Church Hurt Confessions, and it's going to be awesome. You are going to want to pay attention for that one. But they pulled out a book I wrote and said, you told great stories about this person and how much you love them. Yeah. So what you're saying can't be true. These accusations of abuse can't be true. And I remember having to tell them, no, 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 no. This person is really great at these things, and I love them so much. And... They've done some things they should have never done that is incongruent with this over here. Both things can be true at the same time. We're so uncomfortable with that tension, though. But most of us, when we get hurt in a church, we don't hate everyone who hurt us. There is some love to those people, or there's some love to the tradition itself and the people who are connected to it, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes it even harder, I think, to say something. But when we love people... When I really love someone, I'm willing to correct them. Well, I mean, if you really think about it, if a stranger off the street did something you didn't like, you wouldn't be hurt because you really don't care. Um, no, people you are crazy. Love I expect that. people to be crazy. But you don't love that person. The only people that can hurt you yeah. are the people that you love. Mm. Or connected to, trust, you know, respect, all those things. I mean, mm-hmm. I lost my whole family. Most people can't hurt me because I'm... I've shut myself off from caring about people as much as possible. The people who hurt you most nature. were the people who loved you most. Right. And they well, were I only able to hurt you that bad because, because I love you them. love them so much, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. See, you can love me all day and hurt me, and then it won't matter because it doesn't really hurt me. I didn't love you back. If I mm-hmm. love you and you don't love me and you hurt me, that's when the pain starts. Yeah, it, you, The person, you, you can't be hurt by someone you don't love. Yeah. And nobody gets deeply involved in a church family, deeply involved in volunteering, all of these things. If you don't feel loved, you feel the love of Christ, you feel the love of this community, it's awesome at its best. Yes. I still believe that the local church is the hope of the world. I just think that the local church that we see in America, for the most part, doesn't look anything like the local church that Jesus died to create, right? I think that's a problem. But... We love this community. We've had great experiences. So now when abuse happens, when mistreatment happens, you don't want to believe it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to lose the good that you've had, right? And all of a sudden, now your soul is almost fighting against itself. Mm -hmm. I know this thing that just happened was wrong, and people need to be held accountable, and I'm better than that, and, and that we need to protect people from that. Also, I love the people who hurt me. More than that... I love the people who will be hurt when this abuse comes out. And it gets really hard. We, we, we can't hold those things in at the same time. So what happens is it's something called cognitive dissonance. Mm-hmm. And that cognitive dissonance, on top of the gaslighting that we've likely already experienced, that you've likely already heard, that cognitive dissonance starts making you think, I am crazy and you're being torn apart from the inside out. So we just want to say... Right now, if you're going through church hurt and this is new to you or you're going through you know, significant spiritual abuse, it's okay that you feel the cognitive dissonance. It's okay that you struggle with both wanting justice and knowing this is wrong and wanting accountability, yet also loving the church and loving that community and maybe even loving the people who actually abused you. Okay, that doesn't mean that you wanted the abuse. That doesn't mean the abuse is your fault. It simply means that you can have two feelings at the same time. I'd consider it a stage of grief. Mm. It is kind Tell of me grieving. More about that. Mm. I mean, when you have that con- uh, cognitive dissonance, you you're you're beginning because of the circumstances. You're beginning your stages of grief. I had yeah. it, and it, it and it took me <laughs> years to get past it the more they did the more I got you know through that stage of grief into anger and then you know um sadness Mm -hmm. and loss 
and acceptance. Absolutely. Eventually, you yeah. have to go through your stages. It's just an additional stage yeah. of grief. Well, I mean, you got to think about it. What's one of the earliest stages of grief? It's, it's denial. Mm -hmm. And that happens with spiritual abuse and church hurt more than anything else. We begin to, we get a little bit of gaslighting. We start believing it and we deny it ourselves because it hurts so bad to experience that cognitive dissonance of what we're going through. Well, right? I mean, you can witness something or experience something or somebody does something to you in a place where you trust uh, people the most, really. You're thinking, I can trust these people more more than sometimes my own family members or mm -hmm. what, you know what I'm saying? Like they're your church it's family. It's usually the way it's put forth to you. We're a family. Right. We're a family. Uh, welcome home. And so... I, I I remember witnessing something. There's very gonna early be on. someone who hears this. We just gotta pause. I There's know. gonna be someone who hears this and they go, "I know what church you're talking about." No, well, we have welcome home on our screens. We have welcome home on our shirts. That on there, oh. there are hundreds, hundreds of churches, hundreds that use the same graphic yes. on their shirt. Okay, we're not talking about your it. specific yeah. church. That is no. broad. No, it is broad, and that's why I said it the way I said it and had that look. The way. <laughs> so, well, they like, cut you home, off from well, from the outside world. This yeah. is your family yeah, oh, yeah. but the no the the church that i had to call out publicly they had documentation for years where they thought everything i talked about on social media was about them so this is just for you if you're a pastor who's watching or if you are a church goer who's watching and you're like jeff is tearing down my church one i'm not tearing down your church um and two the fact that you think everything is about you and your church is because you're so insecure okay it's not about your church unless the shoe fits, but if the shoe fits, wear it. And if the shoe fits, get out of that church or do something about it, pastor. It's not okay to stay that way. So if you're getting upset because what we say applies to your church, change it. Do something about it or shut up. I love you and I'm willing to have a conversation with you about anything. But man, if you're just bagging on us because, hey, you're talking bad, you're saying things that are bad that my church does okay well then either they're bad or they're not your church does them or not let's have open conversations i believe more pastors than not more churches than not will actually make a change in that moment if they don't leadership is beyond them and you need to find a new church yeah Do you remember the soapbox over that's okay um, go ahead says, and i'll come uh, back i'll circle back a minute so <laughs> oh it's okay when we're talking uh, when the bible was talking about pharisees which, which time? Yeah, which time? <laughs> a lot of, I mean, during Jesus' life. Jesus have, pretty much only yelled at the Pharisees. Yes. Right, but why were they Pharisees? Besides the fact that they were jackasses? Yes, besides mm -hmm. that. Yeah, well, they were educated. They were well-known. They put in the work. They, were, they wanted to be seen, and they wanted to be popular. They cared too much they, about leadership in and the power saw, it held yeah, and, and they, the money they, they could They started making derive, changes right. that were mm -hmm. not biblical. They started mm -hmm. deviating from the teachings. They started deviating, and the further, the further you go away from the love that you're supposed to show mm -hmm. and the structure that was put forth in the Bible, the closer to Pharisee you get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Pharisee, it looks good. Smells terrible. Pretty. Smells bad. Smells terrible. Yeah. Right? And that's why a lot of times church looks good. Church looks good. Things in ministry look good. And then you, the closer you get, the deeper you volunteer, the more you do, things start seeming like they're a little off because Pharisee looks good but smells bad. And the closer you get to Pharisee, the worse it smells. And sometimes yes. the closer you get to the inner circle of yes. church, the louder they get, the worse it smells. Well, that, so that is a perfect segue back to where I was because I was thinking I, I, I witnessed something that was quite shocking of uh, someone uh, in leadership. Um, and I'm like, is this happening? You're in shock. This you know, can't be real. Yeah, this can't be real. And you're trying to process it in your brain. Mm -hmm. You're trying to process it in your spirit. Mm -hmm. you're and you're trying because, again, cognitive dissonance. Correct. It is killing you. Correct. And, and, I'm, I'm, in, and I'm just like, what do, I, what do I do? Am I supposed to say? So thankfully, at least... I did speak to trusted individuals in my circle, right? That I knew that I, at least I could get this out and not keep it in. Mm -hmm. But really, it should have went beyond that. Because, again, you're talking about how, how hurt, uh, hiding hurts. Well, if you don't, I'm thinking about what I saw and how that could have affected not only that person's inner circle, but how it, uh, what, here's what I was worried about. I'm going to hurt the the reputation and what is going on here at this very large 
I, I thought ch- wonderful church and um the and I'm but I have this information. But if I don't share this information, it's going to hurt people on the other anyway. side of information. And so then to me that's worse because um you know, it, it festers. It's just like anything. It's like if it's like if you don't clean a wound that has that, that is there, it festers. It can, you know, continue to but because of the raw rot and still right. in a mm. paralyzed decision. Yeah, well, it eventually gets infected and it can kill you. Kill you. Right, a tiny cut can get infected <laughs> and kill your kill your entire body. Right, or your spirit. Yeah. Yes. Um. And, and guys, we we got to think about this. Like before antibiotics and stuff, sometimes it was the smallest wound that killed that actually right. would kill us. Right. Sometimes it's the smallest wound that takes out the body. And a lot of times when churches go down, it's something small, but it's something small that couldn't be hidden for some reason. It couldn't be hidden, and then everything that people had seen, like Vicky for years comes out at one time and now it's an avalanche. It's too much for that pastor to recover from. I'm all for pastors and churches recovering, right? For them being restored. You can be restored from one abusive situation or from one mistake. You can't be restored from a pattern. You can't be restored from decades of doing this. And here's the thing. Abuse doesn't stay at the same level. The longer abuse goes on, the deeper the levels go, the worse it gets, which is why, again, you can have a pastor who starts out with one small abuse of a little bit of unwanted sexual advance against uh, a woman. And, and let's say this, it's not even a sexual advance. It's an inappropriate flirtation in a text message, but no one calls them on it because they want to protect their reputation. The next thing you know, 10 years later, they've destroyed a family, Right. And then if it keeps going on, you find out 15, 20 years later, they've destroyed multiple families because when it finally comes out, they've got 10 side chicks that are all married and all have kids. Yeah, you get right? braver and braver and braver and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger because why not? You can get away with it. <laughs> well, the thing this? is, well, we're not perfect. We don't expect do leaders mean? in the church and pastors to be perfect people, but they should obviously be way better than what we're talking about here, you know, we're talking about instances of, of abuse of leadership, uh, you know, um, or, you know, of course we're talking about sexual, you know, inappropriateness and whatever, but I mean, we're not perfect people. And so we should never put people on a pedestal. However, we do, we do that. We're human. However, we love, we should hold people who are supposed to have our spiritual, um, life if you will in their hands to help us lead us through that they should be better well they jesus be said if you desire to teach it's example, a example. it's a noble task mm-hmm. because you'll be held to a stricter judgment yeah, right absolutely so you said we don't expect pastors to be perfect people and that's true we don't expect pastors to be perfect people we do expect pastors to not be douchebags yeah, yeah. right we do expect pastors to look like jesus because if you're not looking like Jesus, what are you doing? And Jesus never abused anybody. Jesus never bullied anybody. So again, pastors, we don't expect you to be perfect. We don't expect you to be perfect. We do expect you to not hide under the rug the mistreatment and abuses of people. And with that, we probably just lost like 100 subscribers because I said douchebag, but it's okay. The shoe fits where it. I mean, honestly, when you're in a position of power, it's very easy to... Um lose yourself um and when you're expecting someone to follow the steps of all the perfect person you know it can be very stressful however when someone has pointed out hey um that's that's not right that's not okay your job as the leader is to course correct i'm sorry course correct fix it yeah because that's your job your job is to fix it you're you're not a person in power. You're a shepherd. Your job is to protect the people under you, mm-hmm. not yourself. For sure. And that's the main job of the shepherd is to protect people. And that's why you have suggested, Jeff, that, you know, because of that, that's a big weight. That's a big weight to ask it's of people. Lot. Absolutely. But if you have agreed to do this and you've signed up to do it, 
we appreciate it. Thankfully, I'm glad your people are doing that. Um, then um, you need to be supported as well. And so that's yes. why you were always big about, hey, get therapy, get support, yes. because you cannot do this alone. Nobody can do this alone. No. You'll burn out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's okay or, to step down for a while, too. Temptation it, that, is there. And that right there. Man, that that That's the break. thing. It is okay, pastors, to step down and take a break. We've had too many churches and denominations. I actually remember I was taught. I was like 20 years old. I'm going through Bible school. I'm going through seminary. And I was taught, don't ever have a gap on your resume. Once you start in ministry, don't ever have a gap on your resume because people will assume you had some sort of moral failure or something going on. We've got to normalize a gap in the resume where it's okay for a pastor to go, hey, nothing huge happened. I wasn't healthy. And as a shepherd, I had to take a moment to get healthy. Mm -hmm. Churches, elder boards, deacons, denominations, we need to normalize Letting someone take a season away to get healthy, a pastor takes six, 12 months away to get healthy when they're being proactive, where we still pay them and they don't lose their job because we need our pastors to be healthy. Yes. yes. I'm a pastor. They're I'm still in, I, I'm not a pastor day to day right now. So I'm not, not walking Jesus. in that calling, <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not shepherding people day to day, Right. but I'm an ordained pastor. I've shepherded people for more of my life than not. Pastors, I get what you're going through. It is tough. There is nothing harder to do in this world, I believe than ministry, but there's a heavy weight to ministry. We will either carry that weight or we'll be crushed by it. We'll be drowned by it, right? Jesus said it's a heavy burden, right? Not everyone should want to be a teacher because you'll be judged more harshly. Jesus also said if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, it's better to put that concrete block around your neck and go sleep with the fishes. Mm. That weight, you will either carry it or it will crush you. If you're a pastor listening right now and you say, Jeff, I want to do better, but I'm not healthy. I can see these things coming. Reach out. I want to help you. We want to help you to carry that weight. We don't want it to crush you. But if you suffer in silence, if you don't let people know that you need help, you're going to end up hurting people in ways that you never dreamed. Because I've never known of a pastor who got into ministry and said, you know what? I want to destroy lives. No. People get into ministry because they I want, want to, to do help. Stupid stuff and make really bad choices. Yeah, no, I don't think I that want to ruin my reputation and the churches at the same time. And my time. wife's or my husband's or yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same thing. Nobody gets married and says on their wedding day, "Oh man, I can't wait to do this. We're gonna have about seven good years, two bad years, and a messy divorce where my wife takes everything." Yeah, that's not the goal. That's not what you say. You say. No. But you start getting unhealthy. You don't go to therapy. You don't talk to your spouse, and before you know it. You're porn addicted, and that's affecting your relationship. And then before you know it, you're having an emotional affair with someone. And then before you know it, you're having an actual affair with someone. Then before you know it, you're having an affair with three people, and your wife finds out. Nobody gets into this and says, I want to hurt people. It's a slow fall. It's a slow slide. That's why the moment you feel unhealthy, if you're in church leadership, you're a pastor, you're a high-level volunteer, you're a senior pastor, reach out. Get help, and there are people who will help you. We want to be a safe place for you to come. I'll tell you this. If you're a pastor listening to Church Disrupted, and you ever come to us, you come to me proactive, saying, I'm trying to fix this, I'm trying to get healthy, I will protect you as much as I can. We are never going to hurt you or use that as a story or try to take that public. The only people that we're really interested in pushing on are the ones that refuse to get help and want to hide what they're doing to gain power and keep power. So if that's you, man, we want to help you. Reach out. Don't go through that alone. We need we need you. <laughs> we we do need we, you. need you. Can, and, can we, that's can coming we just from stop? someone yes, that yes. that that would have loved to have someone to say, "Hey, I'm accountable for my actions, and I I love you as a person, and I love you as a child, and I'm going to do everything I can to protect you because that's what we need." Mm. And I think it's so powerful. So right for someone like right now, like I'm looking in your eyes and I know you don't cry much. I know you don't like to, and I can see the tears welling up, but for someone like you who doesn't even go to church because the depths of your hurt to say, pastors, we need you. That's not a pastor saying pastors, we need you. It's not a worship leader saying pastors, we need you. It's someone who isn't even in the church going pastors, we need you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we connected. We connected because in a role where I wasn't your pastor, I was simply a pastor who, who tried to see you, right? And I'll never forget the first conversation we had. You had a, a couple of tears like come to your eyes. They didn't even get out yet. You were like <laughs> trying to escape the conversation. And I was like, okay, we're um, done. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't want to keep pushing you. It was a, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. I've, 
I've, I've caused you hurt. I'm so sorry. What, what can I do? What did I say? And it was like, you didn't say anything. Cause hurt. It's there. It's already there. It's just, if, and, and like I said, if you understand or if you you, you haven't crossed the line to where you understand you've, you've crossed that line and there's no coming back from it and you want to fix it, please do. It means a lot to the people, even the people that you did hurt. It means a lot that you are yeah. willing to fix it because that's all we want is for you to fix it. Justice is, is the only thing I have ever wanted my whole life yeah. was justice. Somebody to say, I'm sorry, but not faking it because I've, mm-hmm. I've heard I'm sorry. Mm. No, I'm I've, sorry. I've, and we're going to do something about it so that there's I not another Sarai fixing it. Mm-hmm. So that is, that's the thing that happens though. Like all I wanted and I told, you know, when I, when I, um, had to respond to my church and had to end up taking it publicly, went through the entire church discipline process and nobody was willing to look at anything. Right. I told them the whole time, I don't want anybody removed. I don't want anybody to lose their job. We're not to that point yet. What I want is an admission of this pattern of abuse. You don't have to admit it to me. I want an admission. I want an apology again, not to me, an apology to the people that we've hurt. I can go without an apology. Mm-hmm. And they all, the third thing, I want a plan of some sort, even if it's imperfect, that says we're working on changing so it doesn't happen again. And you said that there's a key word you you just said there too, Jeff, is we. Because when you admit or you say, hey, okay, I'm hearing you and um, I... I, I need to change. I need to fix this. I'm I'm going to hold myself accountable to this, whatever. You're not alone. There will be people willing to still be in your corner to help you and fix and fix it with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I would have been the first person if that pastor had said, you know what? We're calling our own foul here. You're right, Jeff. And here's what we're going to do to make it happen. I would have been the first person to go public and say, hey, we had a great conversation and I could not be prouder of my friend. Because they actually took ownership. Not only that, ownership. y'all were both watching from the sidelines, seeing these things come out. You would not be thinking of anybody in the church leadership or this church as a villain. You would be saying, I have greater respect for them than any church leaders around because they were willing to call their own foul. Pastors, sometimes all we have to do is call our own foul. That's it. Because people don't even need you to apologize to them all the time. They need to know that you that you see what has been happening is wrong. They need to know that you see that people are victims and that there's a better way that it doesn't look like Jesus. And when you do that, people are more likely to forgive. Cancel culture usually doesn't happen in the church world because someone made a mistake. It happens when we find out they've been hiding Mm. mistakes, especially if they've been covering up mistakes. Let's talk about some of those cover-ups. Okay. Let's talk about them because... And uh, actually, before we talk about this, uh, before we talk about that, let me say this. I still remember, and I'll tell more about my story later. That's not this podcast episode, but I still remember getting fired, having my firing blamed on God, that God was firing me. Mm -hmm. And not only getting fired from my job, I was a youth pastor and it's all I ever wanted to do. I was one of those guys that wanted to be a youth pastor when I was 50. Like I just love teenagers and, and, and I know how hard it is being a teenager. I was saved as a teenager. So my entire life trajectory changed as a teenager. So that's all I wanted to do. And overnight I go from being a hero to a zero. I get fired, all of those things. That was tough because it felt like something was wrong with me. I was defective. My calling was coming to an end, but I could have handled all that. What made it toughest was being told by someone I trusted and someone that I loved, you can't tell anyone. There's only three people who know what happened here. And outside of your wife, you can't tell anyone. We're going to move you. We're going to make it look like a promotion. We're going to tell everybody a good story. And if at any point you tell people what actually happened and that we are firing you and that you're being punished or we're, we're doing this and you don't let us just make it look like a nice transfer, right? If you tell anyone, we fire you and your wife immediately. Because people can't handle knowing what's really happening. And it brought me back to Jack Nicholson. Like all of a sudden, you can't handle the truth, right? But that was the most damaging thing for me. And it wasn't even that moment. It was the next year, half of it being in a pandemic. A global pandemic where I sat by myself going through the toughest year of my life. Questioning everything about myself. 
-hmm. A lot of nights, if I can be honest, crying myself to sleep because life just totally turned upside down overnight and I couldn't tell anybody. I couldn't tell anybody. The only people I could tell was my wife and my therapist. And if it hadn't have been for them, I don't know what would have happened. I don't want to ever see anybody go, when we hide, here's why it hurts. Because when you need people the most, you have people the least. That's right. And my greatest regret in ministry is lying for them, not even because I lied. And that, guys, that messes with me to the core of my soul. Because I pride myself on being an honest person, a brutally honest person. Mm. But even more so than the moral dissonance of lying for so long and lying very publicly. What hurt me most is having to go through that alone. The greatest regret of my life, my life, is going through that alone because I hurt my family more. I hurt myself more. I slowed down my healing. Um, so I would just tell you the first reason why hiding hurts is because when you feel like you need to hide the most, it's actually when you need people the most. And if you're hiding, you can't have other people come around you. What does it go back to scripture? What does it say? Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed, right? Forgiveness comes from God, but healing comes from other people. Right. And if we're not confessing our sins, we're not going to be healed. But if we're not confessing the trauma, we're not going to be healed. Right. We're not confessing the sins of other people. And it's not to confess and be a gossip about them. It's saying, this is what happened to me. You can't heal what you hide. What is hidden will never heal. Instead, it will grow. That trauma will grow. That pain will grow until it gets to a point to where it comes out sideways and it affects your life in new ways because you've held on to it for so long, mm -hmm. right? Self-worth goes upside down. Oh, yeah. Oh, it turns upside down in a moment. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some actual global, not just national, global examples of this. And all the examples I'm going to pull are things that have been in the news in the last like three, four months. Okay, this is very recent stuff. Um, let's talk about places where abuse was hidden, church hurt was hidden, people thought they were doing the right thing, not only did they stay in their trauma, but it comes out years later that there's a line hundreds, if not thousands long mm -hmm. of abused victims who are broken and their lives have been changed forever. Mm -hmm. So Matt Redman, some of our listeners know Matt Redman, some of them won't. But um, if you go back like five, seven years ago, Matt Redman was one of the most popular worship leaders in Christianity worldwide. Okay, so he's a guy from the UK. Um, he was heavily involved in the passion movement, which I, you know, I remember being a college student going to passion conferences and, and a student mm -hmm. pastor taking students to passion conferences, loved Matt Redman. And I still do incredible worship. Some of the most iconic worship songs in the last two decades, this guy's written, but he started his ministry career at a ministry called soul survivor in the UK. Okay. Soul survivor in the UK. It's, it's led by this guy, Mike Pilavachi. Okay. Mike Pilavachi's leading it. And it comes out in just the last couple of months. I think in June, it broke that there was a lot of pressure of former victims coming out and saying, hey, I was a bullied, I was abused, all these things happened, Mike did them from Soul Survivor, right? By the middle of July, he was no longer in his post. He was removed and statements were being made. And here's what happened. I'm going to read a lot of this stuff from news sources. Uh, just so you guys know, it's, it's, it's most of it's coming from uh, the Roy's report. Some of it's coming from Christianity today uh, from the Christian post, but Grammy award winning worship leader, Matt Redman has disclosed that he experienced firsthand the harmful behaviors of soul survivor co-founder Mike Pilavachi, who resigned Tuesday from a church near London amid allegations of decades long abuse. Right now, I want to give props to Matt Redman. I want to give props to him for coming out because it would have been easier for him to say no comment, right? Mm -hmm. Also, at the same time, I want to say you don't get as many props when you wait until it's all out and you need to distance yourself from the negative because he's still a public persona. So part of this is distancing himself from Soul Survivor because people knew he was a part of it, right? Um, but here's what happens. In a 500-word Facebook post, Redmond stated, and this is the quote from Matt Redmond, over a hundred people have reported being mistreated by longtime youth pastor Pilavachi. And he added, the allegations against him cover a whole spectrum of harm, physical, psychological, and spiritual. So he knows of hundreds of people who come forward 
Okay, It covers physical, psychological, and spiritual harm, but he continues, I feel particularly strongly on this issue as I myself experienced firsthand the harmful behaviors that have been described. That's what got me. I'm reading this and I'm thinking, well, at least you're coming out about this now. And then, then all I could think was Matt Redman, you had, and I'm not trying to trash Matt Redman. Okay. I, I really respect a lot of what Matt Redman has done, but Matt Redman, you had a public platform where people across the globe would have listened to you in a way that few others would. Your platform so outrivaled Pilavachi's that you could have turned this upside down. You experienced this abuse, which I get is so hard to talk about. You knew other people were experienced it, but you didn't say anything. You didn't say anything for See, decades. I think that's maybe part of it. It's like you, you've got the, this public persona. Um, I, it sort of goes back to that weight of I'm going to look, th- I'm going to look bad. The other people are going to look bad um, because I have written these beautiful, wonderful worship songs that people still sing today and I'm going to ruin all that and I'm going to ruin people's spiritual lives or whatever that weight of what it was going to do if mm-hmm. maybe he came out I'm not trying to make excuses but I'm trying to put myself in well, you're, you're, you're empathizing yeah. right empathizing just because I know what it felt like for me and that I feel like that's a very similar thing but also um if he's experienced it too then he's also a victim mm-hmm. and when you're a victim of something that's a whole another immobilizing to be honest with you. Well, I hope not normal, but it's like immobilizing for sure. I mean, it's I like mean, that's a move. whole another layer of, I don't know what to do. Well, and you said a minute ago, so right. You said, well, there's nothing wrong with that. You're playing devil's advocate. You're not playing devil's advocate. You're playing victim's advocate. Mm. Cause you're going, Matt Redmond was a victim too. And I see how hard it is for a victim to talk. Yeah. And I get that too. Like I know how, how hard it is to come out publicly. Um, so I don't want to shame Matt Redmond at no. all. I just wonder, I wonder what would have happened if he had if used he his platform to expose it. this a right. decade earlier. Right. He probably wonders too. Yeah. <laughs> to Honestly, honest. yeah, oh you're gosh. probably, you're probably right. That's I so mean, true. Yeah. I mean, he's probably right now going, I should have said, said something. I could have stopped it. And mm. and that's coming from someone. Okay. So side note in, in where I grew up, the religion I grew up, um, we have something called this fellowship and it's kind of what you experienced just mm. without kicking you out of the church kind of thing. Um, and the thing is that everybody that participates in that now, I, I've never been to fellowship, but I've, I've known people that have, and I have done the things that would hurt another human being. I have, mm. I've shunned people, <laughs> which I am not proud of, Yeah, you know, and when you get out and you realize the harm that you yourself have caused because yeah. you just went along with what they wanted you to do, honestly, there is he is probably kicking himself. So the fact that he put that out shows that he is, in my opinion, he is in pain because he didn't say yeah. something. Well, I'm wondering, you know, this this trend of the NDAs. I, did he have an NDA? Did he have something in his contract? Did I don't he, know. You know, I mean. You know, they if you're high, if you if you do that's pretty that's pretty heavy well, to have something just in there that says you can't speak out when you're a victim to I mean yeah know. they do well, and he was you. popular enough and had enough money they could have come after his platform and he wouldn't have everything yeah 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 so I'm I'm still proud of him and I mean I think that's wise and I think you know what I'm still proud of him too um, the, the, here's the power of this. I tell uh, clients all the time, it's impossible to be curious and angry at the same time, Mm. right? And Sarai, you just showed that because we talked about this and I'm feeling my anger rise up on behalf of the victims. And you guys got curious, you asked questions, you got me curious. And now I'm over here, even though I wasn't blaming Matt Redmond to begin with, um, now I feel it to a whole nother degree. Mm -hmm. That's why we got to get curious, which is why I think the power of curiosity there is no church that should ever refuse to listen to a victim. There's no church that should ever, hey, you're telling them why, you're, you're hitting them with facts as they're telling their story. Listen first. Even if their story's not 100% correct, take the time to listen and say what is correct here. Instead of just what talking can to we them learn here? And, and shutting them down. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, and a lot of times we don't even 
talk to them or we, we try to give them, well, I'm I mean, just saving face, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like just, well, I firmly believe this, you know, mm-hmm. I was able to meet with, you know, the, the, um, the church that I was doing church discipline with, and it got all the way up to the elders. There's like 12 elders. Only three of them came to see us. And they came to our house because we're not allowed at the church. It was made very clear. I couldn't even help my wife clear at her office after she got fired. Right. But three of them come to our house and they were nice. They they were nice and they prayed over us and they talked about, you know, Hey, we're going to worship together in heaven. And I believe that. And I appreciate that. But it became very clear about, about 30 minutes in, you came here to try to pacify us. Mm-hmm. You weren't really to, here to listen to you me. You weren't here to listen to me. You weren't here to make any change. You weren't here to decide if what I was saying was believable or not. You came in with a pre-decision, but you wanted to be nice enough to pacify me so I would go away. But then this is why some people don't speak up, because they feel like they're not going to be heard. Mm-hmm. They're not going to be heard, and there's not going to be a change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I know a pastor friend who had his reputation absolutely assassinated. Okay, he gets fired from a church on stage. Multiple people come across and make it sound like he got fired because there's some sort of moral failure and, you know, say things like, hey, there's absolutely, you know, they said things w- w- without saying anything so it could get traced back. They said things that made it look like it was all on this guy. He did something horrible and um, that's code. why he got fired. Escape so yeah. his reputation gets destroyed in his community. Well, he goes to the pastor, right? He goes to the elder board at the church where it's at and they actually listen, which is fantastic. They listen, they meet with him, they hear his stuff and they say, you know what? You're right. We, you know, we've listened. We've seen the evidence where we didn't do what we told you we would do. We did make this look bad. We're so sorry. We repent. Will you forgive us? Well, the Christian thing I'm supposed to forgive. So I forgive him. And then he comes back and he, he, you know, he still struggles with it because it's okay. They destroyed my reputation they told me they were sorry, asked me to forgive them, and then now nothing happens publicly where they own up to this at all, and my reputation is still destroyed. Mm-hmm. Kind of right? sounds familiar of uh, uh, Hillsong. And... Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll get to Hillsong. You're on my list. <laughs> so let's get back to Redmond, though. Okay. Um, he says, I've spent years trying to fully heal from my time at Soul Survivor, and painfully, I know this to be the case for a lot of other people, too. So that's where my curiosity initially kicked in. I was mad until I read that. And then of course you guys went levels deeper on curiosity than I had went. So he's dealing with his pain. Mm-hmm. He knows a lot of other people are dealing with his pain. He spent probably a decade trying to heal. Cause this was decades, mm-hmm. plural mm-hmm. 20 plus years long of abuse. Um, but he says in recent months, public allegations have service, uh, have surfaced, um, that Pilavachi abused young men in his care for decades. He bullied them. He gave them full body massages. He pressured them into engaging in extending wrestling matches, right? Now, here's the issue, though. Here's here's where I do have an issue, and I never want to victim shame, ever, okay? Because I understand how hard it is, and there are some of you who are listening right now. You've never shared anything, and you feel guilty about it. We don't want to make you feel guilty about it, okay? We just want to help you heal. And we can also call a foul when it's a foul, even if it's on the victim's side. We can understand why they made the foul, but it's still a foul. So he says this, or or the the article said this, Redman had previously publicly expressed support um, for, wait, I read that wrong. Actually, never mind. I'm not calling a foul. Um, He had previously uh, expressed support for uh, Pilavachi's alleged abuse victims, right? but this was the first time he divulged that he was a survivor too. So we didn't know that we thought he was just someone previously on staff. And that's totally my fault. I was going down like a, I read that wrong the first time and had no clue, which is again, why we got to be able to say that's on me. Right. A foul is a foul. So he had done a great job of like a couple of months ago when this came out saying, Hey, I support these victims, but we didn't know until mid July that he had been a victim too. Um, but he says this, and I think this was cool. I felt now was a good time to say more. So from 1994 to 2002, he was the worship leader, soul survivor. He stepped up. He's corroborated this. He said, these are the things that I've seen. He said, I stand with the victims. And at the end of the day, Matt Redman has done so much more good than harm, right? But I think it's also important to note what you said, Sarai. 
I think this is probably true. I don't know Matt Redman. I can't talk to Matt Redman. But my guess is he probably carries a lot of guilt over not saying something sooner, right? And I get why he wouldn't. I get all the things that went into that. I get how hard that even is for him to talk now. Um, but I carry the same wondering of what could have happened if he was able to use his platform sooner. Every person who is a victim is not going to be able to share, but some of us can. And those of us that can, I think it's helpful when we can push it into the public eye, not to hurt people, but to simply say we don't want this line of victims to grow. So it needs to be more of an accepted behavior in in our churches today that we allow people to have a voice and step up and not be afraid to say something if without like some kind of repercussion or loss of something that be it job or volunteer status or what, you know, whatever that, whatever. Instead, there's tremendous loss. Yeah. And because you've already been hurt and you're carrying that around. You've already been struggling spiritually. So you're still carrying that around. Then, um, if you do finally say something, now that it's it's all resurfaced and raw again, and you have now brought the person that you needed to talk to at least one of them uh, into it, mm. and then you're reliving that on top of thinking about now what are they thinking about me because I said some. I mean, it's yeah. like a big, huge well, hurt on top of hurt on top of hurt on top yeah. of hurt. Yeah, it's tearing a wound open mm-hmm. over and over again. Um, as a mm-hmm. as as a survivor of sexual abuse, I can tell you that. Usually when you go through trauma, you talk about it and it makes it better. When you have been through something like that, you relive everything. The Mm. smells. Sounds. The sounds, the place. If there was music, if there was mold, (laughs) how the carpet felt, you relive everything. Mm. And it doesn't matter how much therapy you go through. How much you talk about it. You relive it every single time. And that is for a woman. Mm. For a man who is not, that's not meant for him unless he was predisposed for that. For a young man to go through that and then have to speak about it. I cannot imagine the amount of the the open wound that this man has to have. And we don't know what part because that's, it's, it's, wide reaching the abuse. We, there's nothing, there's been no allegations I know of, of sexual abuse there yet as far as full rape. Right. Um, but there's a lot of sexual abuse leading to those things. Right. So we don't, we don't know what Matt Redman went through. We just know that he said, I can corroborate. This is the kind of stuff I've had to heal from. Um, and that's the thing. Like when you go through it, we don't talk about it. We do need to share trauma to heal from it. There's no way to heal what's hidden, okay? At the same time, it can feel like you're reopening that wound and it's just as painful or more painful the second time. But what's hard is you feel like your it does it's diminish. Church is your safe space. It's supposed to be a safe space or I could go get help if I needed it. You know, it's no it's no different than my students in my classroom to come to me knowing I'm I'm in their corner, I'm a safe space. I I'm I'm gonna help them, right? Mm-hmm. But it's when people who are in these positions uh, the of it, it, it should be a, sh- a safe space, Sheesh. but and they are the abuser. I mean, th- this is a major problem. It, it's so this uh, is why churches. And again, if you're a pastor listening, this is very important. If you're a church leader of any kind listening, this is very important. Every church should have a very clear whistleblower policy. Okay, that if anyone has any allegation of abuse, any allegation of mistreatment uh, of sexual, physical, mental, emotional, it doesn't matter. If there is an abuse, who do they go to? Who will listen to them? How does this process work where the victim is protected and the victim is honored? Again, the first time I sat down to talk to anyone with the last church that we were at, it was when they came with a folder full of evidence for why the things I said weren't true. If you have evidence for why a victim's wrong before you ever even listen to them, there's a problem, That's right? A problem. And for some churches, actually for a lot of churches, that means that uh, abuse reporting doesn't go to the elders. It doesn't go to the deacon board. 
um, that it would go to uh, maybe a mediator or a private firm that is held on retainer or someone else. There's got to be a way for people to go where it says you're going to be heard, you're going to be listened to, and an investigation is going to happen and it's going to happen by someone who is not in power, Mm -hmm. right? That is not in power there. Okay. Uh, Because otherwise if the investigation, you know, if if the person you have to go through immediately is the abuser, you're not going to go to him. That's why I love Matthew 18. And Jesus talked about Matthew 18, Matthew 18. We're supposed to do that. Go one-on-one to your brother when they sin against you. But sometimes we have this issue with scripture where we forget that Jesus wasn't trying to be all encompassing when he said things. He was talking to people in a moment in his day. I don't believe for a moment that Jesus wants a victim to go one on one with their abuser. No, yeah, no, um, especially I mean, they need a safe a place to go with well, a pastor. To be fair, or, no, there is an instant on the in the Bible where uh, there was a woman who was raped in a field. Nobody saw. There was no witnesses. And deep Old Testament. Mm-hmm. And this woman was it was him against her. And I, if, if I was that woman, I wouldn't go to him and be like, Hey, you know what you did? <laughs> you know, you, you know, do you want to apologize? Well, You're not wow. going back to your abuser. Well, of course right. not. Cause I mean, and they do take that scripture and that's where victim blaming comes in. Mm. Well, that's victim blaming, victim shaming and this weaponizing scripture, mm-hmm. you know, then they start with, well, what did you wear? Well, well, well did, why did, did you get that close? Why did you, why did you, why did you? And as if it's your fault. It's my fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's the child or the well, woman or and, the, and mine, less power. The for stuff we person. went through was not sexual abuse in any way. It was really just emotional, spiritual abuse. It was a lot of exploitation, but bullying. it's still your right? fault, according to them. Mm-hmm. Well, they sat down with evidence, and I had scenario. three people tell me for two hours why it was my fault. Exactly. Every, everything I brought up to them, they had a reason why it was my fault. Right. Right. Um, so let, let's finish the one with Matt Redmond here and then we'll move on to another one that I think is very connected to the sexual abuse stuff that we're talking about. Oh, yeah. Um, a good number of those, a, a good number of those who have spoken to the investigation, including my wife, Beth and myself, this is Matt Redmond had come forward previously at the time of being mistreated, mm. but were ignored, mm. patronized mm. or gaslit mm. by those in leadership. And there you have it. And that's got to stop. This is a continuing pattern of behavior. And it just, I I don't understand why we don't, I mean, we're supposed to be uh, in this together. Mm -hmm. Believers together, the church in the world, we're supposed to be helping people know Jesus. Are you showing Jesus when you act that way to people? Instead, we'll have people who will tell us, pastors and church leaders who will say, if you bring up any sort of abuse, if you call a foul, if you talk about something that's wrong, then you're causing division in the body and we're supposed to be unified. No, no, what what you just talked about is what I'm thinking. We're supposed to be unified together in saying these things are not godly, right? So I understand when I read that, so, and, and I wanted to take you guys through kind of the emotions I was feeling, the roller coaster, and I got a little off the rails there for a minute. This is the roller coaster that I was feeling when I was reading this, though, because then I got there and I'm like, well, of course he didn't say anything, because when he tried, he got shut down. Mm-hmm. When he tried, he got gaslit. Now, that was before his platform was huge, I'm sure, and all of that sort of stuff, but that's the issue is that most of us, we don't know where to go because there's not a clear uh, reporting policy. There's not a clear whistleblowing policy. But even beyond that, once we go to who we're supposed to go to, you're left with no one else. Mm -hmm. And I remember... And the buck stops there. I remember I went one-on-one to the pastor in question. He refused to talk to me. I went with two witnesses. He refused to talk to us. I went to the elders. Only three of them met with us, and they spent you know a couple of hours gaslighting us and, and, and victim you know, shifting and Mm -hmm. victim blaming. And then finally just tried to pacify us and appease us, told us to get witnesses, didn't pay attention to the witness statements that were there. So we got to the end of it and we had a choice. And this is why I know there's a lot of people who disagree with the choice that I made when I went public and wrote an open letter and said, Hey, this, this can't keep happening in this specific church. Right. Um, there's a lot of people who disagree with the choice that I made. I hear about it every day to start this podcast, to start bringing these issues to light. Because even though we're not naming names for the most part, unless it's you know already been in the news, they think we're tearing down the church. But here was the decision that I made. I either say I went as far as I could go and I got ignored, 
patronized, and gaslit by those in leadership. The exact quote from Matt Redman. Or, I say, okay, if leadership's not willing to follow the Bible, then I will go one step further, and I'll go public. And when I went public, there's a lot more I could have said. I could have said so much more damaging things, and I did not because I just wanted to bring awareness. But the reason why I went public and then stopped talking about it, like I'm not talking about anybody at a specific church or names anymore. The reason why I did that was because I wanted to share enough so that people could know what was going on and make their own decision. And have now, an open if you stay in conversation about yeah, it, I hope they're having conversations about yes. it. But now if you stay and then you experience this later, at least I feel like I'm not responsible. Mm. It doesn't, I, I'm not saying if you stay, then you deserve what happens to you. I'm Absolutely not saying that not. at all, but in scripture, I believe it was Ezekiel. Um, the God had given him a prophecy and he said, if you don't warn the people, mm -hmm. their blood is on, on your head, hands. Yep. right? Their blood's on your hands. But if you do warn them and they don't do anything about it, their blood's on their own hands. And that's kind of where I was at was if I don't warn people, mm -hmm. then their blood is going to be on, on my hands. So when I read this, I could see Matt Redman and I being faced with almost the same choice. Yet he had a different response than I did. But also, I'm older. Mm -hmm. and he was at that point. I'm much older. I don't know if he'd ever been to therapy. I don't know what support system he had around him. So I can't blame Matt Redmond for what he did or didn't do mm -hmm. after the hurt he'd been through. But what I can do is I could say I can do all that I can do where I'm at. And for those of you listening, some of you, you can't share publicly. It's not good for you. It's not healthy for you. It's not going to work. But some of you can. And all I would ask is that you do what you can do. But if we all hide and keep those hurts hidden, they're going to grow. It's going to grow. That abuse is going to grow like a cancer in the body until it kills it. And eventually there will be a line, hundreds, if not thousands long of people who have went through exactly what you and I have went through, right? So when we see that, just ask, who, who can I tell? You got to tell somebody, even if it's just one-on-one -on -one, so you're not going through it alone, right? But if you feel like you have the resources, if you feel like, you know, hey, God is calling me to, to, to take it public or to push it, don't be scared of that because that is not tearing down the bride of Christ. That is protecting a future line of victims from having to stand in that line. Mm -hmm. What I had to learn was that <clears throat> if you're going to believe in God, you can't, you can't dishonor or hurt him hmm. because the church isn't him. They're people. There are people that have decided to congregate together and speak about him. Well, if that's the case, then they do not represent God. God represents God. Mm -hmm. And you're going somewhere to, you know, learn more or worship or have a community. But at the end of the day, these people do not, they are not God. They do not represent him. They try to interpret what he has said. They pass it forward. They try to be as close as they can mm -hmm. to emulate, but they are not. They're shepherds hired by the master. But here's the thing. Look, I run a business. Everybody you hire doesn't work out. Everybody you hire doesn't do the job right. There are people, there are managers that I have put in, in place in large businesses that, man, I thought they were great. The business owner thought they were great. And uh, every time we walked out of the room, it was like a totally different person was there. Not everybody gets it right. But that's also the reason why if you've been hurt by a church, if you've been through abuse, and I get it, I'm there. This is the reason why I'm still in the church after what I've been through, though. Because it's the same thing of if I go to a restaurant and I get food poisoning, and I got to give credit to Tim Ross for this, you know, this is his example. If I go to a restaurant and I get food poisoning, I'm not going to stop eating food. I'm not going to stop going out to restaurants, right? Because not every restaurant is bad. But I can tell you, I'm probably going to stop eating that dish. Something significant's got to change. I, I got salmonella from a Cobb salad one time. And now I can't eat any salad with egg in it ever again, right? Because it does affect you. But the reason why I say that is one person hurts you. It doesn't mean that you have to be done with the church, right? I understand how you would get there, but I still go to church because I am, I am looking for the best expression in that community. However, I'll be completely honest. I can't go into a mega church and worship. I can go into a mega church and consult. I can't go into a mega church and worship because it triggers too many things in me. That's the Cobb salad. So the church I go to now, I mean, I, I love my church. It's about 60 people. 
on a good day and they go verse by verse and uh, the pastors had us over to his house and, you know, checks on us. And I've got another church that I want to check out because that pastor doesn't even know us and checked on us through text message and Facebook message Mm. probably eight to 12 times while we were going through our bout of hurt just to say, Hey, I, I am with you and I'm praying for you. And I'm so sorry you're going through this. So I say all that just to say at church disrupted, there are people who think we're totally against the church. We're not. And I'm never, ever, ever going to throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are incredible pastors and there are incredible churches and God makes a difference that we could never put into statistics that we can never really put into words in their lives through those churches. Um, there are also people who never belong in the pulpit who are doing great damage. Both things are true. Mm-hmm. I can hold both. So what we're doing at Church Disrupted, we're trying to shine a light on this stuff that shouldn't be happening so that it's hard for people to get by with while celebrating the stuff that's happening over here that we need more experiences with. Um, here's how that that section ended. Matt Redmond said, historically, you know, he talked about being uh, gaslit and patronized and ignored by those in leadership. Mm-hmm. Historically, there has been a failure of care in this area by those in authority. Mm-hmm. And he talked about it just at Soul Survivor. But I think it, if there's been a failure in that area of authority in the North American church, in the European church. But he says that failure makes this current moment even more critical to get right. Mm-hmm. that's why we're doing what we're doing at church disrupted because the amount of abuse victims that we've seen sexual, physical, emotional, mental, there's too many people in that line. Mm-hmm. There's too many victims. Keep, this I moment is hearing, critical to get right. Yeah. Cause you keep hearing about how it just grows and grows and you find out more and more and more. And this is why hiding hurts because like we said before, it's a festering wound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Older. So let's talk about Bill Gothard. You guys know who Bill Gothard is? So Bill Gothard was a head of kind of like a national ministry. Um, If you go back and you watch the documentary, um, Shiny Happy People, it's about the Duggars and Bill Gothard. Yes. The Duggar family was a part of that movement that he was leading. Mm. Okay. So Bill Gothard, you know, the big conservative, you know, uh, religious leader, right? In 2014, he resigns from the organization following allegations of sexual abuse, right? Um, At one point, if you actually look at the documentary, you see him being forcibly removed because again, all these allegations are making them look bad. They finally get rid of him and he has to be forcibly removed because that's his seat of power, right? But that's 2014. A year later, several victims of Gothard's alleged sexual abuse and filed a civil suit against him. And they had a lot of evidence. Mm -hmm. Here was the issue. It had to be voluntarily dismissed in 2018 because so many of the things had passed the statute of limitations. Those victims went through so much and they hid it for so long that by the time they wanted to share and said, we can't keep this hidden anymore, the statute of limitations had passed, Mm -hmm. right? So it ends up getting thrown out. If you want to watch the documentary, Shiny Happy People, if that's not going to trigger you, again, be careful. Yeah, it's um, pretty pretty tough it's to pretty watch. It's pretty tough. And I've not even been through, yeah. thankfully, at that kind of experience, well, but it's tough to watch. I let my wife watch it, and she just kind of told me about it and showed me pieces, and then I started reading news articles about it because it was too much for it me. It was too much. Right? So, so I get it. I couldn't but finish it, it. But if you want to learn more about it, they're very real about that stuff there. Um but it had happened again for decades. For decades, he had been sexually abusing, not just sexually abusing, he had been grooming these girls. Grooming. Right? Yep. There was an article I read today, and well, I, and I the don't... boys. Yeah. Well, there, there's an article I read today that I don't have um, in front of me, but it actually talked about one of the abuse victims who talked about, uh, you know, she went in, Gothard puts his hand on her thigh, tells her he loves her, and then pulls her up to his office. And she says in the documentary that there was another male there who watched, heard it, and turned a blind eye. She just, I think in like the past couple of weeks, has come out and named the dude. And he was just a male secretary who's sitting there who watched it happen and let it go. They were protecting Bill Gothard. Why? Because Bill Gothard was the golden goose. Mm -hmm. He was making the money for the organization, right? Now there's a lot of faith components there, honor components, but we can never honor a leader to protect abuse. 
if honoring a leader means protecting abuse or the mistreatment of people, then that's a leader who doesn't deserve honor. Okay. Honor culture is fine. And we're going to talk about this in a later podcast episode, but toxic honor is wrong. And in a lot of evangelical non denom churches today, there is toxic honor. I'm going to tell you toxic honor. People may not agree with me. This is my opinion, but I think it's toxic honor when you serve on a staff or you're a volunteer to church where when the lead pastor walks through the room, everybody has to stand and clap. And y'all both just gave me looks like that. That doesn't happen very often. That happens at predominant churches that you know and probably have heard really good things about. And if they walk in and you don't, everybody doesn't stand or you don't clap loud enough, they'll walk back out. Not only is that in the church, there are allegations with a uh, popular football coach right now that he's doing the same thing. A Christian football coach who has always been known for you know, like mentoring his players and bringing his faith into it and all that. There's been allegations that, that he did the same thing. That's toxic honor, right? Um, um, that's worship. When you can't call the person by their name. And I've idol, been, I've been through this worship. one. Worship. Well, I've been through this one. You can't call that person by their name. Their pastor, Bill. Their pastor, Sean. Their like pastor, Becky, right? It's, it, it is so ingrained in my mind because I was in a culture where we weren't made to do it in our culture. It was expected, but they talked about cultures that made it happen, right? I still can't talk about my former pastor without calling him pastor first name. Every time I'll go, well, yeah, pastor blah, blah, blah said, and then I'm like, or one time pastor blah, blah, blah did, and then I have to stop myself and just go and say his name. Well, but I also know that we're of similar uh, age. I think we're pretty close in age, Jeff. And I, I think I might be just a little bit older than you. But I'm 37, so I don't know where we're at. But if, well, close, if you... close enough. I still think you might come from a generation. You're you're, you're younger than me, obviously, but like uh, close enough to where I feel like there's also a level of respect. Because, you know, when I was raised, you know, you always said, yes, sir, thank you, ma'am. It was, yes, it was sir and ma'am. And, you know, in this day and age, that's tough to do anyway because of the whole, you know. Respect issue. That respect is issue. You have anymore. this, like, we're all on different levels now. And, and, you know, the feminism, all those things, right? You know, gender, but whatever. Okay. Um, oh, we have to have a podcast it gets about that. real crazy well, in, in my teacher brain because, um, I, when I first started teaching, I would say that, yes, sir, you can sure, sure go to the bathroom or whatever, you know, just because of I'm showing them my kids respect yeah. too, you know, it's like, so to me, if I, if I look at someone like my pastor as a leader that I respect in my church, well, I should say as a, you know, it's like yeah. Mr. Cochran. Well, well it's pastor. Mr. So-and-so. Yes, Wait, sir. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. But mm-hmm. how many of your students call you teacher Vicky? They don't. So, yeah, why is that? A th- yeah. You know who, hey, oh, listen to this, though. They do in Japan, now, though. Now, Sensei. my wife and I, we mm-hmm. just went to D.C., Professor and one of the things Wells, that we did over Professor, this weekend Professor in D.C. Yeah. was we actually went to the Holocaust Museum, right? And uh, one of the things you'll learn is with Hitler, you had to call him Fuhrer. Mm-hmm. You had to call oh, yeah. him by his title, right? right? Um, I know people who earn their doctorate degree, and they're like, everybody, including my kids, is going to call me doctor because I earned it. Um, and honestly, I think they're douchebags. I think that's toxic honor. Like it's okay. I'm going to call people. If I know that that they've got a doctorate degree, I'm going to call them doctor in public and stuff like that. But every time I talk to them, I'm not going to call them doctor. Mm. Right. In these scenarios with toxic honor, it's, you're talking to the person and it's well, pastor, blah, blah, blah. Right. Like you can't say it without saying pastor. So honor's not bad. Honor's fantastic. I'm a big believer in honor. Honor and respect where it's appropriate. But when we start giving standing ovations every time a pastor enters into the room and we can't say their name without saying pastor, that's worship. You said it a minute ago. That is worshiping a man instead of God. Mm -hmm. They become your idol. And Mm -hmm. that is a dangerous Mm -hmm. place to be. But we're not talking about toxic honor. So I'm not sure how we got into that. Cause that's another, that's a whole separate <laughs> whole podcast, podcast. Right. Um, but that, but that was Gothard. And by the time this has come out, if you watch shiny, happy people, there is a line of hundreds, if not thousands of victims. Cause there are still people coming forward who are just getting the courage to come forward. Yes. And for everybody who comes forward at any point that you come forward about any kind of abuse, yeah. I'm so proud of you. Yes. yes. And I'm so grateful for your courage. It doesn't matter if it, if it was immediate or if it took you 20 years, I am proud of you. Yep. And you need to hear that. Yes. Not because I matter, 
you just need to know that people are proud of you. Okay. Um, Everybody okay. here's proud. 30, of you. Don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like look, 30 years. Listen, it's like you're tra- you're trained, you're brainwashed. You, I mean, that becomes a, a a pattern of abuse that you're used to. I mean, mm-hmm. that is not an easy thing. And you especially it in for this a long instance, time. of course, but especially in this instance where it is a spiritual leader mm. who has used that power that they have over people. I mean, this is a really. I mean. That that is so. There's no words. I, there is no words. I mean, it's I want to say such it's so almost as it's evil and worse dark than the than the act itself. Honestly, in my, in my opinion, Wait, right? The cover up. The, the cover up is worse than 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 well, the act itself. Even we, though the act itself stuff is, really is bad. bad. Well, right. it's kind of like, and I don't know if y'all are sports so fans. Dumb. I use a lot of sports analogies. So, uh, sorry, listeners that don't watch sports, but uh, talk to your sports friend. They'll explain this one to you. <laughs> but it's kind of like when you're watching, you know, a basketball game. You're watching, you know, the NBA. The, the best athletes in the world, the best in the world at their craft. And, man, you'll see someone just, like, throw an elbow. They almost knock somebody out. And then what's the first thing they do? They throw their hands up like, what? Not me. Well, I didn't, I didn't foul anybody, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. You know? and, but then every once in a while, you'll see somebody that they just, like, man, they straight up chest check you. You fall over, and they're like, that was me. Mm-hmm. That was me. I so respect the players they are like, that was me, yep. my bad. And I despise the ones that every time they foul, they're like, what happened? Why are you against me, ref? What are you doing? Right. right? It's the same thing with pastors, though. We have some incredible men and women of God who will go, that's on me. I did that. I was mad. My fault. I don't need to do that again. I'll take the punishment. You know, They're going to shoot the foul shots. I'm going to have to go sit on the bench for a little while. Right? I respect them so much. I respect the pastor that has called their own foul and had to sit on the bench for a little while to heal more than I respect the pastor who's never done anything wrong. That's the one I would go to anyway. Right? Mm -hmm. Because I know what you're like when it gets hard. Mm. Right? Now, I wish all the pastors that I knew hadn't done anything wrong, but we don't know what they're going to do when it gets hard. We don't know if they're hiding something. Right? But the person who's called their own foul, we know what they're going to do. But there are so many pastors of, and again, it's the quote unquote most successful churches. They're the ones that are just like, what? Why are people against me? Why are they doing that news article? Why are they? And here's how they, they phrase it. They get in front of these pastors, get in front of their congregations and hold up their hands and go, that wasn't a foul. That's just Satan trying to stop the movement of what we're doing. And let me motivate you, because if we're being persecuted for what we're doing, Mm -hmm. then we must be doing Doing it right. right. If Satan's against us, then we must be doing it right. So y'all pray for us, but we're going to keep pushing on. We're going to keep pressing on. We're not going to backstroke. We're not going to back up. We're going to keep doing this. And the next thing you know, I've got friends calling me. They're like, I think you're Satan. Of course. And you're just persecuting the church. at least his minion, one of his minions. (laughs) Yeah. I Rebels don't think I am. I really don't think I am. You know, scripture says that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus is Lord. He's my Lord. He's Lord of my life. And I believe every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess. So uh, if I am demonic, then that's going to mess with your theology. But that's just for a few a few corner well, Jeff, people. Jeff, I wasn't calling you a devil. Oh, I have been called. <laughs> I have been oh, called demonic in this process. Here. I'm not wow. kidding. What? Like, that's real. I believe it. I believe it because I've been called the devil too. Like I've got receipts. I've got messages. It's almost like they are spiritually diseased. I got that one too. That wow. Well, it's like they're throwing off all the things they actually are onto (laughs) their uh, victims. That's how you really feel, Vicky. Well, they say. Well, they say you can't accuse somebody. Might have to beat me out here for a second. I might want to cuss a minute. (laughs) I mean, seriously. Well, we put the explicit tag on, so cuss away. We're fine. No, I mean seriously though. I mean, it's so angry, but so weird to cuss when you're talking about God. I can't do it, and I cuss like a sailor. <laughs> and it's me. <laughs> oh. Well, we said we were going to be honest, honest on this. And real. Okay, and honesty is expected. It's so it's if, words. It's okay. if you're being it's honest and you need a word, <laughs> if you're being honest and you need a word to get that across, honesty is expected. So I'm going to tell you, if you're listening to this podcast, it, 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 at some point someone's going to drop an f bomb. At some point. <laughs> Every cuss word is going to get said. Okay, we're not doing it on purpose. We're not just trying to hurt you. My son just walked right behind me as Actually, I said that. Actually, it was Candace. But, okay, well, somebody did. I, I saw the legs. Uh, <laughs> but, guys, we, we just want you to know, if that bothers you, just be prepared. If you get into an episode and you start hearing that, if someone's on a roll, you may just want to, again, turn it off. Don't throw the podcast out unless you want to. I mean, we, our identity is not on how many people are listening to the podcast. 
But I want you to know if that triggers you at some point, it may happen. That's okay. Turn that podcast off. Uh, catch up with us on the next episode. But we're going to be authentic. Yes, Honesty is expected. It's one of the podcast rules, and we're serious about that. But they were it's really, not an yeah. easy podcast to do, to be fair. And, well, no. and your emotions will get to the point where just, mm. it, it, there's no other way to express well, I'm a protector. anger and, and frustration. I'm a protector, so I get yeah, mad, are. mad. I get mad too. Like I don't know if you've seen me, but like I'm not a cusser. I, I don't cuss I'm very often at all. Um, there are times where the only words that can express right. the foulness of my opinion is that. So if y'all watch every once in a while, my like when I'm off camera, I'm, I'm getting ready to say something, and my well, face is twisting because I'm trying did to figure say out douchebag earlier. So, <laughs> but what I wanted to say was so much worse. I know, and you did. I so cleaned good. it up. So, Proud of you. and we still probably lost like a hundred. You know, subscribers. <laughs> yeah, so ready. Well, I just yeah. said it too. <laughs> the the day I posted the church disrupted trailer, it was just the trailer. I lost like ten subscribers that day, and I'm like, oh, dang! If y'all getting mad about the trailer, well, I think, well anyway, yeah. well, well, anyway, it's truth, a truth. cultural so, thing. I think we still got, let will give you a couple more examples of again, why hiding hurts on the broad scale. And then I want us to land the plane on like personally, why it hurts you okay. because when, when we hide, it hurts us more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, if you're familiar with the vineyard movement, a lot of people aren't, um, but there's vineyard churches in the USA, like, you know, uh, vineyard Anaheim recently became the dwelling place. There's the vineyard worship movement. Um, but vineyard is also all across Europe. Okay. Vineyard UK. Um, Alan Scott, was a well-known pastor of a successful church in the UK. And if you got a successful growing church in the UK, everybody thinks you're doing something right because they're way more post-Christian, post-modern than we are. Okay. But Alan Scott has been accused of abuse for a while. And has just been saying the whole time, no, I don't abuse people. No, I don't abuse people. Even though more people keep coming out and saying that he abuses them. Okay. But the Vineyard Church is the United Kingdom because he was in the United Kingdom for a long time, got accused of abuse, and then came here because that's what a lot of pastors do. Mark Driscoll gets accused of abuse, loses uh, Mars Hill because he was severely abusive, starts a church in Arizona, like, you know, a couple of years later. That's mm -hmm. what we do. Um, by the way, if, you know, do some research on your pastor and make sure that they've not done this, like yes, multiple other places, because all of my pastor friends, they're fine for you Googling their name because they don't have anything to hide. Right. Okay. But some of these guys like Google their name, but anyway, vineyard churches, in the United kingdom and Causeway coast vineyard in Northern Ireland are now apologizing to those who were harmed and mistreated mm -hmm. following the release of findings that former CCV pastor Alan Scott abused his power. So now they had a third party do the investigation to shut people up. And now the facts have come out. Oh boy. He was abusive. And this is mainly abuse of power, like bullying staff, bullying people, mm -hmm. bullying people, like what your body image. Like one of the things he's been accused of um, that multiple people have corroborated is you, you got a certain body shape and that tells us what kind of sins you're dealing with. What? He only wants certain people with certain body shapes <laughs> in leadership. And I wouldn't be there because my body shape, he thinks is like super sinful. So um, wow. it's a little too round, a little too plump for a guy for him. But Following an initial, here, here's what the, here, here's a couple of things from the news report. Following an initial round of interviews, trusted HR, that's who did the outside investigation, has identified repeated patterns of manipulation, inappropriate comments, narcissistic behavior, and certain occurrences of public shaming and spiritual abuse. And again, we've talked about sexual abuse and stuff. This, there's no sexual abuse here. But it's not any less abusive. It still affects people. The manipulation, the inappropriate comments, narcissistic behavior, public shaming, spiritual abuse. I've experienced all those. Um, and al although I empathize with you, Sarai, and can't imagine what you went through, I also am not going to minimize my own abuse just because it was different. Absolutely not. No. Right? no, abuse no. is abuse. But it doesn't matter what These kinds mean. of abuses are, are happening all the time, and we minimize them a lot because we're like, well, it wasn't sexual or physical. Right. It's just as bad, especially okay, with adults. But you carry the, I mean, the trauma is it, it, so yes, sexual abuse is, it, it affects your way of dealing with other people. And it's worse because it's criminal. And it's physical. However, yes, because that's not a sin. It's and mental I think that and that's physical. important to separate. Right. However, a trauma will still carry through your life. Absolutely. You will change the way you do things mm -hmm. based on your trauma. Yeah. Yep. It might not be sexual, but you well, will change who you, you are. You can have yep. such trauma right. that you have PTSD from yep. being in a war and having to kill people, yep. from being in an, a, a verbally abusive home and from being raped. The same PTSD diagnosis hits us all. Yep, absolutely. Right? So it's trauma. Anyway, 
So they said, um, they talked about that in a joint statement. They released that. It said, uh, people tried to raise these concerns about Scott's Scott years ago. Um, when he was still pastoring in the UK, right? But nobody listened. The trustees, here's a quote, the trustees of CCV, which is the church he was at, acknowledge that they are responsible for the governance and oversight of CCV. They accept that they failed to spot some of the warning signs and did not have sufficient structures in place, that's the reporting policy, the whistleblowing policy, um, to ensure complaints came to the attention of the trustees, and they apologized to those who have been hurt. They don't really apologize for the abuse. They apologize that the abuse was allowed to happen. Okay. Meanwhile, results from a separate organization wide abuse and response team were published a little later than this. Right. And, uh, one of the victims in that it was quoted believes there's no safe space to report concerns. And then the people who were doing the investigation said there's no safe place to report Mm -hmm. concerns. But what did Alan Scott do? He got up the week after this happened, the weekend after this happened, and preached, and in his message, talked about the persecution (laughs) that he was going through Mm -hmm. for the kingdom. Riled his church up, they're all for him. Um, But again, this has happened for decades across, guys, three countries and two continents. It's funny. Three countries and two uh, continents. Prosecutors or persecutors turn into the victims yeah. so quickly. Pastor, if you've had a problem uh, in three countries and two continents, you're the common denominator. You're not being persecuted. You, you have you. problems, okay? It's, it's you. It, it's you all the way around. But again, there are thousands mm-hmm. of volunteers and staff who have been shamed, abused, all the way around being a part of this, and no one listened. Then you go, here's the last two. We won't go into these as much. I don't have articles pulled up for them, but Hillsong, the documentary, The Secrets of Hillsong, came out about the same time as Shiny Happy People. Mm. If you've watched The Secrets of Hillsong, so much of this came out, and there was scandals that started with the pastor of Hillsong, New York, Carl Lentz, who simply had an affair, right? They get rid of him. They sacrifice him on the altar. Even though he tried to actually come clean and say, hey, I need help. Right. Because he knew he needed help. He wanted yeah. help. Wonderful. So he wanted help and he um also wanted um uh, um like counseling, if if I'm assuming like just like just to get through yeah. that and said, Look, and I'm, he wasn't I'm, trying to just stay in power. He tr- right. No, he had even tried to back down from having power and had said, Look, I need a break. Just what we talked about earlier about needing a break. And I'm not saying people. what he did was okay, so, okay. But at least he had tried to do some of the things that we have talked about here. He's human. He's he is absolutely human. And they had put him on celebrity status, and he had become celebrity status. He had he become had the leader of the church too literally, early. Literally, literally had celebrities hanging around him. He was known as a celebrity pastor, right? Yeah, and he so put him on a pedestal. And found yeah, well, phone. he's like baptizing professional athletes in their bathtub and everything else. But he gets on a Zoom call with them, and he's talking to all of the overseers in Australia over Hillsong as a whole with Brian Houston, their senior pastor, their global senior pastor on there, um, which I hate that term. Hillsong's at least global. Like they're all over the world. So their global titles mean something. I served at a church where if you were like a central director, you were global, this, that, and the other. Don't and get I'm me like, started on what global I'm, means. I'm like, you're, you, you exist in one pocket of Tennessee. What you're not global, anything anyway, but he says on, on the documentary, I told them everything because I wanted to do the best I could to get help. And I wanted the church to survive. I told them everything. He said, I never realized it was going to be used against me in that way. Say so totally use him as a scapegoat. But then you fast forward. And over the past few years, one thing after another has come out until finally Brian Houston, the global senior pastor is removed because there's this pattern of abuse with him. He stumbled into women's hotel rooms at conferences and said it was because he mixed medicine with alcohol. He has a DUI in the United States and says, Oh, I made a bad decision and I moved my car from one parking space to the other. And I got caught. It wasn't that bad. I'm so sorry. Right. He also covered up his own father. It comes up that they believe he's, covered up his own father's sexual abuse for decades mm-hmm. and that he, he found out about it. And it's believed that he lied mm-hmm. under uh testimony with the Royal commission, the Australian Royal commission. Right. 
Um, so now he finally gets that. removed when the stink gets so bad. He finally gets removed, yet still says, I'm just being persecuted and has people online following him, waiting to see when he starts a new church. I'm just being persecuted, right? Mm-hmm. There are hundreds of victims, probably Bad. thousands upon thousands worldwide with Hillsong that has said this is a pattern and it went across campuses and it went across countries. It went across all this. Well, there's but, even a podcast about, uh, you know, a lot of this, but also even the level of the uh, abuse and the way volunteers at the church were used as basically free labor. And yeah. I mean, it goes pretty. They used their college deep. to basically exploit people for free labor. But what they did, there were so many people in that documentary and who have come out, you know, with news reports and stuff like this that now say, yes, I was scared. I was scared for so long to say something until it started cracking. And when Houston got removed, it started cracking enough to where people would finally start talking about and it. More and right? more people came forward. But yeah. if these things had been said a decade ago, thousands of victims could have been protected and could have been... They wouldn't have been victims. Well, it, I mean, they wouldn't have ha- this wouldn't have happened. I them. remember serving at a church that I love serving oh, at. And I thought Hillsong was great because the pastors always talk about how much they loved Brian and Bobby Houston. And they spent every summer at Hillsong and we were learning all this stuff from Hillsong. And now I'm wondering, what else did you learn right. from I mean, Hillsong? It's con- no, it's concerning. Right? It's concerning. And this last one, I'm going to be very careful because I think there's a lot of good. And there's a lot of good with all of these. There, there's, there's nothing that has come out that has attached itself directly to them. Um, I like a lot of what um, ARC, the Association of Related Churches, does. They plant churches all over the country. Um, there's a lot of good stuff from them. I know a lot of good people who are a part of ARC. I also know the ARC's model is, and this is well documented, you start big and stay big. So we get you lights, we get you funding, we get you a big team, and you start with two, three, four hundred people. You start big, you stay big, okay? Um, again, the problem with the, the church is not always supposed to be big. No. That doesn't mean the church is always supposed to be small either. But big is not what we're going big for. Big doesn't mean um, you're successful. But, but again, big, doing. big. there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But these churches start big, stay big. Many ARC churches. And if you go to an ARC church, this is not every ARC church. I know some ARC churches that have incredible accountability. But many ARC churches, they're started by really young, charismatic pastors who are probably not ready yet. Okay? Um, and they don't have a good accountability because the arc model for more churches than not that I've experienced is the pastor's accountability is an outside board of overseers. So it's other arc pastors from other cities. Well, one, you, you don't see them every day. So you don't actually see what's going on. Mm. How is someone supposed to take to your board a concern when it's all celebrity pastors? Because if you're really doing well, it's all celebrity pastors, right? Um, and then, so you got people protecting each other. You got people protecting each other. So let's think about this. Uh, you can't let the, it's like, it's like you, you can't let everything crumble. Then everything yeah. is, is destroyed. And again, I know a ton of good art churches, but, uh, Tabner Smith, uh, planted venue church in Chattanooga. I had people who I, I know and love who went to venue and raved about it. It was great. He was an incredible preacher. He was on the preaching circuits. He was preaching at elevation. Everybody wanted him around. He's a great, great preacher. And then a couple of years ago, you know, pictures start surfacing online of him kissing a woman who is not his wife. Mm. Well, surely that's not true. A couple of days later, like within 48 hours, his entire staff quits. Okay, probably true, right? Audio recordings get leaked of him talking to volunteers, trying to you know smooth it all over and just says, hey, I wasn't kissing her. I was whispering something in her ear. The picture just made it look like I was kissing her. Um, there's nothing going on here, Right. Some of the volunteers that stay end up at his house um, to to try to encourage him, to try to bless him, only to find him and the woman almost completely naked at the house. Then there's more excuses like that. Okay, now here's what happens. All of this breaks. This is one of the fastest growing churches, like top 20, I think, at that point. It was definitely top 100 fastest growing churches in the country. Okay, before all this broke, Dino Rizzo who is over a lot of ARC and their church planning and all that, he actually came to speak at, at Venue, and it's still on YouTube where you can see he's talking about how great Pastor Tabner is, um, how they want every uh, planting pastor to sit down with Pastor Tabner and learn from him before he does all this stuff. And again, I'm not saying Dino was bad, okay? Dino probably didn't know these things were happening. But here's the poster boy for ARC. 
the poster boy for Ark, who they are lauding and honoring, and he's in the middle of this massive affair and scandal. Okay, This stuff comes out, though, and again, I'm all for pastors being restored. If the worst thing you ever do is have an affair, right? That mm-hmm. there's a lot worse that you could do. Okay. Sadly, too many Christians think the pastor having an affair is the worst thing they can do. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot of stuff I see done on a regular basis is worse than the affair. Their family can be okay and the rest of their life in shambles. But his entire board quits. They weren't publicized, but from what I know, from what I understand, they were all celebrity pastors and they all quit because they didn't want their names attached to the scandal. Mm-hmm. Right. Again, he was on the preaching circuit. So you can almost, you know, we can make some guesses, but that wouldn't be helpful. His entire board of overseers quits. So one other pastor, Ron Phillips, who was a, a pastor who had retired in the Chattanooga area that was um, very well thought of. He comes in, he says, I will help him. I'll build a new board. I'll help him run through a restoration plan and we'll help make sure that Tavner is restored and Venue can continue doing the good work they're doing, all that. Okay. Two weeks later, Ron Phillips quits. I sat down with him and his wife, and there's a heck of a lot more going on than mm-hmm. I thought was going on. I'm out. Okay. That was, I think, almost two years ago now is when all that happened. Tavner Smith today is still the senior pastor of Venue Church. They've lost, um, they've had campuses shut down, they're under bankruptcy protection but he is still the senior pastor of Venue Church. I think God can use Tavner. I don't know Tavner. I'm not making an assessment of Tavner's character. Here's what I'm saying. That arc model of start big, stay big, take the young charismatic pastor um, who can draw a lot of people and then have the outside board of overseers. What happened with Tavner is a perfect example of why that doesn't work because we either will hide abuse and sin to protect the cash cow or the entire board will quit and you get a guy who cannot be removed from a church when everybody knows he has no business being the pastor of that church. Think about all those staff members that lost their livelihood overnight when they quit overnight and they've had no vindication because he's still pastoring that church. He's still taking a paycheck. I'm really proud of them though. Yeah. I took some conviction. Super proud of them. I am so proud of them because that, that, that takes a lot of courage and, and true faith, honestly, Mm -hmm. in my opinion Mm -hmm. to say, Hey, I, this is what I believe. And you have broken what I believe and I can no longer stand by you and get up and leave (laughs) that you're my heroes. Well, I don't know who you are, but you're my heroes. My greatest regret in ministry is I lied for a year and a half, two years, maybe longer than that over why I left a position that I was in just to, you know, just to protect my wife and I's jobs. And then to look at these people who said to hell with my job, this isn't right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to protect people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the person from, from my understanding, and again, I could be wrong on this, but from my understanding from the news reports and stuff like that, because this is all public record. um, The woman that he was, having the affair with was on staff at his church or the woman that he was accused of kissing. She was on staff at his church, which means it's not just an affair. It's an abuse of power because he had authority over her. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and anytime a sexual relationship starts with one person who has authority over another, um, and in the relationship couldn't happen without authority being laid down. It's abuse. Yeah. It's manipulation. It's an abuse of power. Well, one thing I will tell you, um, Okay, it took you a year, but honestly, I think that was meant to be. And I say that not to coddle your feelings, but, you know, sometimes you have to go through the horrible experiences. Sometimes you have to be quiet for a little bit. You have to gather what you are supposed to do, what you're meant to do. And then when you actually get out of it, you have your full scope. Because if you would have gotten up and left in that moment, you wouldn't be the Jeff I know today. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have brought me out of my shell Hmm. into the point where I, I was afraid, but I made it here. And I am actually able to help whoever are witnesses out there that, that, that are confused that want to get out, but are afraid because they don't know what's going to happen on the outside world. And I can tell you right now, that was you. You, you did that. You got me out of, out of a a fear that I had for 30 years. And 
I am, I am here. So honestly, I am also grateful to you because it takes courage. Regardless of how it happened, you are, you could have said, okay, screw it. I'm just going to move on with my life. I'm going to go to a different church. I don't have to help people, but that's not you. And that's not what you did. And you're fixing it. And honestly, that also is a hero move. Mm -hmm. So don't be so hard on yourself because I see it. I see the pain behind your eyes because you were like, I should have done more. No, you did exactly what you were meant to do. Well, that means a ton. And I'm not, I don't do this because I'm trying to be a hero, um, but I do it. Because Those I don't want people don't to go. Be heroes. You don't want people to go through what you went through and to feel like you're feeling right now. Right. I don't. Um, and I think this is a great example of you don't have to feel shame mm -mm. because you didn't come forward when you first could have. Mm. You don't have to feel shame if you're not ready to come forward. But, and when you're ready to come forward, when the time is right, it will be hard and you won't feel ready. When any of us can come forward, we protect other people. And although I wouldn't call myself a hero and I'm not in this to be a hero, you've said that to me multiple times. I have. Right? Um, and you may not want to be a hero either, but you will be someone's hero when you come forward. And it's actually the people I think who matter most are the ones who will never know you're their hero because they don't get victimized and abused because you came forward. Or so. they don't feel alone. Huge. Um, I truly believe that we go through horrible things in life. There's some people that go through really, really hard times, really horrible things. But somebody told me when I was younger that one day when I get through this and I make it out alive, because that was one of my concerns, that I was going to be someone that another person that has been through what I've been through can go to and see that light at the end of the tunnel. So yeah. you can be that light at the end of the tunnel for those who just don't see it. They don't see a way out. They don't know how to get out. And that is, that is your purpose, in my opinion, in life, is when you have been through horrible situations, your job is to be that light at the end of the tunnel. And it doesn't matter how long it takes you to get here. Hmm. You will be somebody's light at the end of the tunnel because we all need that light. Yeah. We all need that one person where you can see at the distance and be like, I, I, will, I will get there because they got there. Yeah. You know? That's good. Well, so we've talked mainly, you know, we, we talked more than not about hiding hurts because of the line of people who will continue to, to be hurt. Um, abuse again, it's never isolated. Okay. It's only isolated when it's when it's disclosed, right. when we disclose it, abuse can stop. Yes. When we hide abuse, it will always grow. Um, and you think about, you know, you think about Hillsong, you think about Bill Gothard, you think about Vineyard, you think about, um, soul survivor, all of these things, but even Ark, that wasn't a ton of abuse. He really only abused as far as we know, one person, his misuse of power. Yet, how many times? Do we get told, Vicky? How many times do you get told? Well, yeah, his wife too. How many times do we hear in these circles things like, "Hey, you're tearing down the bride of Christ. You're causing people to not come to Jesus when you speak out." Well, I look at Venue, which was an incredible church by all accounts. Tons of people were coming to faith. I know people who were very positively affected by this church. Incredible things happen. But when you have people who are young in their faith and their faith is tied around this one church. How many people are deconstructing right now? They're deconstructing right now or can't trust another church because of what happened well, there. Again, it's I'm a there. lot of people. You can count me as one of them because right now I am, I, I don't want to say limbo, but I'm in a place where I'm like, I'm not ready. Yeah, lost. To, yes, it's, it's like you were, in a, you were in a relationship. The relationship is, is over. And you're like, where do I go? And I'm not ready to open myself up for hurt, like you have mentioned. Um, it and so that doesn't mean that you don't go to churches, but you're not ready to commit to a church. Correct. You're dating churches, right? It's like, yeah, I just went through this yeah. divorce. That's yeah. You know, and we're so, on Tinder. I'm swiping left and right. I'm on not churches, on right? Tinder, but I'm but I'm at least church Tinder. Church Tinder, Vicky. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Keep it clean. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah. <laughs> 
I feel like we, we went have, down. We changed the conversation. We a changed the conversation, but and, and we're. I mean, you know, I think we laugh. And we have humor because this is this is hard. You know, this is yeah. this is hard. It's stuff. a podcast it rule. Hard. We yeah. laugh often because it's medicine to. to the it soul. It is. It is. Yeah. Um. But no, I mean, you know, you. I, and so I'm just speaking for my own self. It's like I'm not. I'm not ready. I'll get there eventually. I'm sure. You know. I'm sure of it. But. Um, light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, there is one, yep. um, but I'm not. I'm not prepared for that because opening up, you know, mm-hmm. some kind of. Uh, well, I'm, you're afraid to get hurt again. Mm-hmm. You just, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of perspective there, which you know I say that, but I need to practice what I preach. Um, perspective is, you know, if you have to walk into a church and understand that it's full of humans, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's a building. And there are good humans, and there, there are, are bad fantastic humans. humans, and there are humans of all shapes and sizes and personalities. Even when they mess up, like we've talked about right now, there's still humans. Even when the pastor doesn't and... want them to be all shapes and sizes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alan Scott. But so here's how I want to finish this out because you know we're uh, we're like a, an hour fifty right. minutes or so into this, um, which you know par for the course right now for us is like two hours or a little over. Um, but you need to put a disclaimer at the bottom of your your podcast. Please make sure you get a snack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You take a bathroom a break. Um, <laughs> say, hey, I'm proud of us. We haven't had to take bathroom breaks. Um, but we talked a lot about you know protecting other people while hiding hurts. But I, I really want to finish with looking at the inside. Why hiding hurts us? Why hiding hurts you when you hide? It's not always about, hey, I need to expose this and protect future victims, right? If we don't talk mm-hmm. to anyone, if I didn't talk to anybody, I would still be stuck in the hurt. If I didn't talk to anybody, uh, I would probably be, you know, working some very menial job trying to figure out what my calling is. Mm -hmm. It was actually when I took a chance and told someone who could have caused me and my wife to lose our job. But when I told someone else and was able to talk through it with them, that was when I was able to start healing. Right. Um, And then when I started healing, I didn't realize it. But later I left my church on my own volition. I said, this isn't a healthy place for me to be. And over the next couple of years, we probably had hundreds of people walking through church hurt and spiritual abuse and church trauma who would come around our kitchen table and they would say, here's what happened. And if you tell anybody, we're in big trouble. If you tell anybody, they're going to come after us for the NDA. If you tell anybody, they're going to gossip about us, destroy our reputation, whatever. And we just sat around our kitchen table and my wife and I would love them and we would listen to them and we would you know, tell them that your, your feelings are valid and your struggle is valid. And we would also tell them that there are still good people in good churches. We would tell them that God is not done with them, but we wouldn't give them easy Christianese answers. And we just walked through it for some of them for months, some of them for years. Right. And it was one of my friends, a couple that we're great friends with who we helped walk through that, who just a few months ago was sitting around our patio table outside, pointed through the window, looked at our kitchen table and said, as I've been praying, all I hear is that God is calling you to extend your table to thousands of other people who don't have a table to go to. That's why Church Disrupted started. This is an extension of our kitchen table to help you heal, to have these conversations, to help equip you, um, but even down to table groups, which we have to have people, you know, pay for those to reserve spots because we've only got about 25 spots at a time. But table groups happen with the camera off around this table to help actual people. If you're in Knoxville, we sit around this table just to help you heal. And if you're not in in Knoxville, they're they're virtual tables. But that's what that's about. Whether you're joining our community or whether you're just talking to a friend that you take a leap to trust, or even for you, if your first step is, I'll just talk to a therapist because they legally can't tell anybody else what I said, right? right? I love Mm -hmm. therapy for that reason. If nothing else, I can be like, you know, I can say stuff that everybody else would not be friends with me yeah. over. And my therapist, yeah. they have to be my friend. I'm paying them and they can't tell anyone else. So, um, but whatever that is for you, whether it's joining a community, telling a friend, reaching out to an elder board, uh, going to therapy, hiring a life coach, whatever that is, talk to someone. Because when you talk to someone, that's when you can start healing. We can't heal what is hidden. And what is hidden will grow and grow and grow until you, it, it's overtaken you and you don't feel like you can breathe. We want something better for you. It won't be easy. I'm not promising you easy, but I'm promising you worth it. Okay, please, if you've went through significant church hurt, spiritual trauma, 
abuse, talk to someone. And uh, if you're not sure where to start and you're just scared, even on our, our, our entry level of the community, we have a place where you can share your story with your name. But we also have a place where you can share your story anonymously and even I won't know your name. Sometimes just sharing it that way is mm-hmm. helpful. But please, share your story. Vicki, Sarai, would, would, would y'all say the same thing? And would you have anything else to add to that? People who have been through different levels of this, but you've experienced your own religious trauma, um, what would you tell the person who's going through that trauma but has so far been going through it predominantly alone? Well, I mean, that that's I, I really don't have anything else to add because I feel like you summed it up very well. But, I mean, even even in a written form, if you can get it out, it's a start because um, it can't stay in here. It can't continue to hide because you cannot grow and you cannot heal. Um, and uh, it is a scary place. It's a scary place to be, but um, wow. At the at what once once it starts and it's out there, um, you're you're a changed person. You'll always be a changed person, but you will one hundred percent become a better changed person for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that speaking to another person gives you a valued third party perspective. Um, when we're going through our trauma or our lost phase, we. We're very narrow-minded. We have a very one-sided, very trauma response perspective. And um, when you speak to someone who has a separate perspective, sometimes in our little world, it expands a little bit. And we become, it, it, it becomes, away. well, yeah. it becomes less heavy mm-hmm. because you're like, oh, Wait, I'm I'm not alone. Mm-hmm. Oh, Scripture oh, says wait, for I, each other's burdens. Mm-hmm. I can I can breathe a little bit. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's gonna get better. Okay, well I'm in pain, but it's gonna get better. Mm-hmm. And and I will find my community because honestly, my burden started when I was eight years old and I said something. Mm. That's that's a hard burden for a child to bear, and it continued my my whole life. I got married, you know, I told my husband, I I never not told people, but it was always very dismissed. The first person to not dismiss it was my brother who has passed. Mm. And then my husband, and he let me deal with my trauma, how I needed to. We were both very young and I, I, I lost people that I was raised with because they were like, Oh, you know, you, we don't know if it's true, you know, and, and it, it was very isolating. It was very lonely. It was very accusatory. It was always my fault. Mm. And that, that gives you a very, very narrow way of looking at yourself and the world Mm -hmm. around you. Nobody's going to believe me. Nobody's going to love me. I am incapable of love myself, which Mm. I told my husband when I married him. Because you have to, these are, you have to learn to love. And I didn't know that was something that you weren't just inherently born with. Yeah. You have to learn to love. You thought you were defective. I was defective. In that moment, I was very, very broken. And I am fortunate enough to have a husband that didn't break me further. But he could have. Well, you had a lot of people who dismissed you. But But it takes one. Well, and if One I could not, just say that to too, not dismiss you, correct? To say directly to our listeners, you may have been dismissed, and say, "Jeff, I get it. I'm supposed to tell people I've been dismissed. I can't keep going through that." All it took was was one, and Sarai, in your case, you had two people that didn't dismiss you, and it made all the difference. One took it to a whole nother level. Um, and again, if you don't know where to go, we want to be here. We will never dismiss you, but do not hurt alone. Because if you hurt alone, you'll never heal. You can hurt alone, but we can only heal together. Yeah, agree. Yep. Yeah, one turns into two. Two turns into and when two or more gathered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that on a whole other episode. That's the most. Uh, that's the most <laughs> twisted, misunderstood scripture that we ever have. Do you know that scripture is actually about church discipline? Um, I believe so. Yes. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Anyway, we're not getting into another episode. That's enough for this one. And uh, guys, we're so grateful that you've been here, um, that you've stuck with us. I know this was a heavy episode, um, but for many of you, I really do believe it's exactly what you needed to hear. It's exactly what God had for you today. So uh, even though it was heavy, I hope you leave encouraged. You're not alone. You don't have to walk through this alone. And for some of you, I really believe that you're going to walk away encouraged saying, I can share my story a little more publicly and protect other people from being hurt in the future. And anytime we get to do that, that's an incredible honor to be able to protect other people. But hey, wherever you're at, we love you. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're a part of the Church Disrupted community, and we'll see you on the next episode.